Okay, here we go. Hit it. It's Friday, May 14th, 2021, episode 131. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we have the great pleasure to welcome back to the show, Lynn Alden. We get an update on Lynn's trades from our last appearance, and then we talk about what she sees as the risks and opportunities going forward. After that, in Talking Charts, Patrick answers the question on everyone's lips. Do you believe in magic? The only question is whether Patrick is a loving spoonful kind of technician or a Sean Cassidy version. You know which one I'm going with. This week in trading history, we go back to one of the great short squeezes of all time, and it's not GameStop. And we end with our segments of no stupid questions and skin in the game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We got a great show. Lena, hop on. Uh, What beer are we drinking this week? Today we are drinking Elora Brewing Company's Elora Borealis Citra Pale Ale. So I've decided this is my favorite kind of kind of beer, a pale ale. Okay, but the, but uh, Labatt Fifty isn't pale. No, ale. it's not. So then, <laughs> why is this your favorite type then? Well, I just like I've decided I really yeah. So Lena, why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Uh, Elora Borealis is a lightly malted pale ale that is bittered, flavored, and dry hopped exclusively with citra hops. A bright floral nose gives way to crisp, light malt flavors and finishes with several citrus notes. See, I goochered it when I said uh, this is my favorite kind of beer. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling. I'm like, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> it's just because that Granville pale ale is my favorite. And I, I, I was going like say. The, I generally like the pale ales. Kev. What about our mark, uh, the Miami Huddle Muddle? Yes. So we have a little of announcement. Uh, just a reminder, the Miami Huddle Muddle will be Friday, June 11th at 10 p.m. That's how they roll out there. They start late. It's free, but capacity is limited. It will be a first come, first serve. The link to sign up will be sent out in the May 27th email. So 22nd. not this 22nd or 7th. 22nd. 22nd. Okay, I got it completely week- wrong. Next weekend. Next weekend. So make sure you sign up this week so that you receive the email for next week if you're interested in coming. Uh, Patrick, why don't you tell us a little bit about it since you're going to be actually, well, uh, you know, captaining the ship. I'm going to captain the ship, but uh, obviously Cuppy is going to be there. Rumor has it that Lena might show up. Lena, is this true? Uh, I cannot confirm nor deny what you're asking <laughs> there there is now. a chance we may know in the next week or two but may or may but, not but uh uh milkshake man brent johnson's gonna be there george oh. gammon's gonna join us and uh rob koifman from uh oh. koifman charts is gonna be there we're gonna we got and i'm trying to reserve a few more people it's gonna be a great shit show <laughs> <laughs> that is gonna be just epic well first of all anything with cuppy involved you know yeah. it's just gonna be off the rails and then Brent and wow. Rob. I actually feel bad. I'd love to meet Rob. I've never met Rob in person. Actually, I've never met any of those people in person. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll FaceTime you. All right. Face I mean, and, if I'm and there. pretend like I'm there. <laughs> All right. Well, give us some side effects. Okay. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include bitter Bitcoin bulimia. <laughs> Lumber futures lacerations and then diamond hand hallucin- hallucinations. Having troubles with Big thanks to Christine, I believe, did all those. She has some others that are quite funny, but I can't pronounce, so I'm not going to use them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's all right, let's get, get to the interview. It's our pleasure to welcome back to the show. Um, this will be your third time, Lynn Alden. Welcome. Happy to be back. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how many people apart from Cuppy come three times, and you're definitely the kind of person that we want all the time. You, be, we've been with you for a long time, and I was laughing with you before the show because I was looking at you, and you were your Twitter account, and your Twitter account is up to one hundred and eighty-five thousand or some obscene number like this. What do you attribute your success? Uh, I think it's, I think it's that I, I kind of hit a couple different cross sections of people, uh, and so. There's the, the, the Bitcoin people, the, the uh, people that invest in gold and commodities, uh, and then also just general macro. And I think it's one of those things where because I'm, I'm kind of balanced, uh, I kind of fit into a couple of different groups there. So you don't make anyone mad, so everyone likes you. 
Yeah, I think I mean there there are a couple. Uh, I think there are a couple deflationists that don't like me, but other than that, uh, but I, but I love some of them too, and some of them like me. So I, there's I not that to... ma- there's not many of those these days. Uh, yeah. with, with so uh, so it's a small group that you're missing with the deflationists. And actually, to be fair, you actually put us on to Eric. Uh, I can never pronounce his last name. What's his uh, the the fellow the the nice young fellow that that is the the probably the smartest deflationist that I know. Oh yeah, Eric Basmajan. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, no, he's a terrific guy, and uh, he, you know, if if I was ever going to convert to the to the dark side of inflation, uh, de- de- deflation, it would definitely be using his theory. So, and he definitely made me think. So, I really actually appreciated you putting us in touch with Eric, and we, you know, we should get him back on the show because he's got some great ideas, and he, it is important to listen to the other side and to, to make sure you keep your mind open to all the different views. But right now, we're in the middle of defla- inflation, and you brought a chart deck, and for those who are, you should make sure you sign up to. Do the market huddle and get the chart deck uh, because it is important, but we will also tweet it out. Uh, why don't you walk us through it, Lynn, starting with uh, kind of what you're thinking with the long-term debt cycle? Sure. Yeah. And the overall theme here is basically updating kind of the fiscal driven inflation that we're, that we're seeing happening right now. Uh, and so the, the context for that is the long-term debt cycle, as we see on, on uh, page one of the slide deck. Uh, and if you look at the, the left chart there, that is debt as a percentage of GDP, uh, but I break it into federal debt on the blue line and non-federal debt uh, on the orange line. And that's mostly private debt. It's a little bit of state debt. Uh, and because those two types of debt uh, have very different implications for uh, deflation and inflation. Uh, and so a private debt bubble, is, a, is you know, especially when it's when it's collapsing and coming down, that's a very disinflationary or deflationary event. Uh, you know, there's a lot of insolvencies uh, and that restricts a lot of investment. Uh, whereas if you have a if you have a public debt bubble, uh, especially it's, it's being you know in large part you know those bonds are being bought by the central bank and not really crowding out other other areas, uh, that can be you know rather inflationary. Uh, and so one of the themes that I've been focusing on is that in many ways the 2010s were a lot like the 1930s as we see in that chart. And the 2020s are shaping up to be a lot like the 1940s. Right. And, and one of the things that I think that a lot of people miss is that they've kind of confused those two. And, and you hear people that have been very successful proclaiming deflation in a, in a kind of a credit destruction event, you know, in let's just say housing. And then they went and tried to apply it to other places like Japan or China. And it hasn't worked so well when it comes to sovereigns. Exactly, and it's because they, they, you know, because if if they can print their own currency, uh, then the risk is not about default, which is you know more de- a deflationary event, but instead it's more about running hot and causing inflation. So in that sense, uh, you know, the constraint there is inflation, uh, and so that when we saw, for example, in the 40s, uh, you know, if you look back in the 30s, for example, that's when you know you had a big big private debt bubble collapse, rates hit the zero bound, you start increasing the monetary base. But you didn't have a rapid increase in the money supply because, you know, even though there were larger fiscal deficits, they were just offsetting some of the loan losses and some of the other money destruction that was happening. But it wasn't until the 1940s, after, you know, a decade of of populism and stagnant economic growth. And then, of course, that led in in part to, to, you know, some of the the military events of of the next decade. When you had that external catalyst that forced a lot of governments to, to spend a lot of money, that's when they had the more inflationary outcome. Uh, and so we're, we kind of saw the same thing play out this time where we had, you know, the, the, the normal kind of private debt bubble collapse. We had banks were way too leveraged. You had, you had consumers way too leveraged. And a lot of that imploded in the, in the past decade. And even though they ran significant deficits for a few years, that was just offsetting some of the loan losses and some of the destruction. So you didn't really see a big increase in the money supply. And it wasn't until here uh, in, in the 2020s that we're seeing you know, the fiscal, uh, you know, uh, injection is so much larger than any loan losses that are happening. And that's why we're seeing, uh, you know, broad money supply go up so rapidly. So then one of the things that I'm amazed at when I read the history books and I, and I, there's, a, there's one book that's a, it's a diary of a fellow that uh, he was a doctor, but he kind of chronicled the Great Depression of the, of the 30s. And one of the things that kind of struck me was the stop and start and their and their unwillingness to kind of just go for it and get themselves out of the malaise. And it wasn't until we had the the World War that it actually kind of created the just get it done no matter what. And that was the fiscal impetus. Do you think that it was um, the same with COVID? And had COVID not happened, do you think that we might have had maybe many more years of a stop and start economy? I, I think so. I think that accelerated it. I, it's one of those things where 
I started writing about this theme uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and so it's, I think it's one of those things where ultimately it was going to be inevitable. But uh, I think that, you know, pulled forward maybe five years of events into one year. And so yeah. I think that's what we saw play out where they, they had no choice but to go in and kind of front load a lot of that, uh, much like how the war forced them to basically front load some of the things that they were probably going to be forced to do anyway. And, and so, Lynn, I do you know you were uh, very early in terms of understanding this. And I, I love I have a question for you. I always use your line, the fiscal dominance, monetary dominance. Did you find that somewhere else or, or did you make that up? Uh, I think I made that up, but I, it's probably one of those things that exists somewhere else as well. well you know, it's possible that I heard it and didn't, you know. It, it's I'm a standing sure. way of describing kind of the what's overplaying in terms of the economy and, and the, the kind of the biasness of it. So I use it all the time and I do attribute it to you. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't misattributing it to you and it was really somebody else's. So um, when, when I think about you writing about this way back when you you had kind of highlighted this um, – did you ever imagine that it was we would go so quickly from kind of the Rogoff book of, you know, this time is different, trying to balance budgets to, it, budget, you know, deficits don't matter, print, print, print? I think we're, I mean, we're definitely on the top end of what I expected. Uh, but it's interesting because, you know, it, it, it's, you know, a lot of the stuff that inspired me was, you know, uh, inspired by other people. And so, for example, Ray Dalio has been calling this for a couple of years now. Uh, you know, his, his concept of the long-term debt cycle and the three different types of, of policy response with the third response being that they go more direct, basically that the fiscal comes in. Right. Uh, and so, you know, it's kind of like everyone has their inspirations. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of those things where I, I think we, we transitioned faster than we otherwise would have, but it's, it's also regional dependent. And so, for example, Europe has not really gone, uh, you know, that fast in terms of making that transition. Uh, but, you know, the United States has been on the kind of the top of the class in terms of of, you know, doing, you know, on the top end of what I expected in an 18 month period for how much fiscal spending they could have done. And then you have other places like, you know, Japan that might be somewhere in the middle. Why do you think that Europe has been so reluctant to embrace that? Well, I think it's it's part of the the political framework they have together. And so because. You know, in the United States, it's hard enough to get states to agree. I mean, part of the, the only reason they were able to kind of do as much as they could is because they, you know, they had that kind of improbable, uh, you know, Georgia uh, Senate outcome, right? So the Democrats got, you know, 50, 50 seats in the Senate. They were able to do budget reconciliation to get things through, even even though, you know, basically bypassing any sort of filibuster. And it's one of those things where it could be a lot different if you had one senator different. And so if you look at, at Europe, I mean, they, you know, none of those countries are, are, you know, at least in the European, you know, the Eurozone, none of those countries are monetarily sovereign. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're basically bound by certain rules. And then they, they basically have all these kind of multiple layers of bureaucracy to go through. And so that system is just less flexible than what we see in, in the United States or Japan. And so do you think that this is going to be the rest of the world looking at the United States rushing ahead doing this and they'll kind of pick up the baton and run with it themselves? I think to some extent, I think, you know, my base case for a while is that the United States is, is going to have to go larger than some of the others. Uh, and that's because some of the forces over the past few decades have led to somewhat more imbalances in the United States. And so if you look, for example, at the level of wealth concentration among developed countries, uh, it, you know, the United States is near the very top of that metric. Right. Uh, and so basically there, there's a, a larger percentage of the population that, you know, is basically insolvent with just a few months of not having an income, for example. Uh, and so uh, and, and so because we have those dynamics and because, you know, we have a smaller percentage of our economy is manufacturing based, even compared to you know, most other developed countries. And so we basically exported our, our manufacturing capability more thoroughly than some of those other countries uh, that basically, you know, we had a little bit more of a, of a break point in some ways. Uh, and and, and we, we kind of saw that with, with some of the civil unrest uh, that was happening in the United States. And so, you know, my, my overall, my base case is that, you know, probably the United States will, will be among the larger ones. Uh, but, you know, there's different countries that are kind of or different regions, I should say, that are kind of, a you know, spearheading different parts of it. So for example, Europe's still been very aggressive on the monetary policy response, whereas it's the United States that, that's being aggressive in the fiscal policy response. Uh, I'd love to just kind of go down this road a little bit because I was going through your your kind of um, 
your website and going through and reading and getting caught up in terms of what you're thinking these days. And I, first of all, for those who don't know, you should go check out Lynn's website and she's written a Bible of, uh, about inflation. <laughs> is that free or is that just for uh, subscribe? Cause I'm a subscriber, so I'm not sure what's free and what's not. If you oh, go that, to Lynn, Lynn yeah, that Alden, public. Okay. Yeah. So if you go to lynnalden.com slash inflation, you can go read the Bible of inflation. It's, it's, it's awesome. It goes through it all. And one of the things that I, I kind of went down this rabbit hole and I ended up in terms of your, the frame petrodollar system piece that you wrote, which I think is outstanding. And you talked about the kind of the replacement of the Bretton Woods with this fiat based petrodollar system. And you said one of the things that I thought was really interesting, you said, instead of drawing down our gold reserves, however, we gradually draw down our ma domestic manufacturing base and it gets replaced piece by piece in foreign countries when most other countries run big trade deficits, they eventually have a big enough currency devaluation so that their exports become more competitive and importing becomes more expensive, which usually prevents multi-decade extremes from building up. However, because the petrodollar system creates persistent international demand for the dollar, it means that the U.S. trade deficit is never allowed to correct and balance itself out. The trade deficit is held open persistently by the structure of the global monetary system, which creates a permanent imbalance and is the flaw that eventually, after a long enough timeline, brings the system down. I, first of all, that's an outstanding piece. It's a great way of thinking about it. Are we in the period where this, this kind of uh, flaw is about to get fixed? Uh, yeah, I think we're starting to see that play out in a couple steps. And so one of the steps is that if you look at globalization uh, measured as global trade as a percentage of GDP, uh, you know, based on data from, say, the World Bank and other sources, that actually peaked back in 2008, and it's been kind of the sideways trend since then. Uh, and so globalization hasn't really reversed, but it, you know, it basically stopped accelerating like it had been for the, for the prior decades. And so that's kind of the, the one of the things I'm watching. Uh, and then two, uh, you know, part of it is that, you know, Part of why the U.S. has such a big fiscal response this time is because, in some ways, our economy is more hollowed out than some of the other economies, uh, and and you know our you know basically a larger percentage of our population uh, was impacted. And interestingly, for example, if you look at uh, you know Japan's um, labor participation rate, uh, that that's higher than the United States now, even though their country is on average 10 years older, uh, and and that's you know basically because you know theirs has been an uptrend. For the past several years, because partly because you know, w with their stagnant population, they've been bringing more women into the workforce. Uh, you know, they they they've been a little bit behind that that curve compared to some other developed countries, and so they've been they've had an upward swing in terms of that. Whereas the United States, you know, we we had kind of stagnant uh, uh, labor participation for a while, and ours decreased more than Japan's during this crisis, and so we had that weird crossover where. You know, even though we're a much younger country, we have a smaller percentage of our population uh, involved in the labor force. And part of that is these kind of entrenched monetary system thing, uh, monetary system uh, aspects playing out where, you know, we're a very service sector oriented economy. Uh, and so when when we have a pandemic that, you know, more affects the service sector uh, and when we have these imbalances, uh, you know, we have a, a kind of a bigger problem in that sense in the immediate term. One of the charts I saw, you know, you mentioned Ray Dalio earlier. One of the charts I've seen in your work before is that you talk about how when you move to a period of fiscal dominance, you actually get um, the lower end of the of the of the workers doing better than people expect. Like there's one of the, there's this narrative out there that inflation hurts the little guy more. And one of the things that you highlighted is that that's not necessarily the case. Do you think that this is a purposeful decision uh, to try to fix that equality problem? Uh, it, it can be in some cases. So, for example, after after World War One, when soldiers came back, they didn't really you know, they were just kind of sent on their way. It's like they were given their bus ticket and kind of sent on their way. Uh, whereas after World War II, for example, when soldiers came back, they were given the you know the GI Bill, so they had tons of benefits, including you know eight million of them getting getting you know sent to college or trained in, in other ways, uh, and so you know a lot of the spending that was associated with World War II uh, actually was ultimately domestic spending, where a lot of that you know it increased the 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 industrial base of the economy, and then it got a bunch of people trained when they came back, uh, and so that was basically their their kind of attempt to correct some of the things that they did. Uh, you know, in the in the prior war, uh, and whereas the '70s was a very different outcome, I and mean, that was just basically you had you had loan growth, you had 
uh, you know, wage inflation. But then, yeah, you also had an expansion of some of the, you know, the domestic policies, right? So the great society things. Right. And that's, you know, some of those environments are inflationary. Uh, and there's, you know, it's, it's people often have overly simplistic things of, of who's harmed or who's hurt by it. Uh, but the challenge is that it's kind of, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's kind of a messy uh, outcome of, of different groups. And so, for example, in the 1940s, you know, if you were holding cash or bonds, which was disproportionately people with means, uh, you know, a lot of their wealth was, you know, in, in partially inflated away. Right. Uh, and then also tax taxes went up significantly on the on the upper uh, few percent. Uh, and then meanwhile, like a lot of those benefits uh, basically went towards uh, people on the bottom, you know, two thirds of the population. Uh, and so basically when, when you kind of, in, you know, calculate government transfer payments, wages and things like that, we see a case where historically, at least, uh, you know, periods of moderately high inflation tend to reduce wealth concentration to some extent. Uh, but of course, that's very different compared to extreme like hyperinflationary events. I'm talking about more like those those moderate inflationary events like we've had in the United States and, and other developed countries. So I, I'm kind of curious about whether you think this this next few years slash decade is going to resemble more the 40s or the 70s. But I've taken us off track in terms of your charts. So why don't we get back on track and maybe we'll answer that question while we're doing it. So the next chart you had on that first page was a century of U.S. monetary and fiscal policy. What are you trying to show there? Uh, that just goes along with the with the concept of the long term debt cycle, and it shows that you know when you hit the zero bound for the first time in that generation, uh, you know that basically you build up so much debt in the system, and interest rates got lower and lower and lower, and there's basically you know there's not much more policy response to do, and so that's when they start increasing the monetary base instead, uh, and both those times where you hit the zero bound, that's when you had a big private private debt bubble banking crisis, uh, and so what I try to show with those two charts, uh, especially side by side. Is that you know in, in many ways whether you look at debt when you look at monetary policy fiscal policy you know the whole 2010s decade just had a ton of similarities with the 1930s uh, and the 2020s are shaping up so far to be a lot like the 1940s where you know that second decade is the more fiscally driven decade and the more uh, you know reflationary or inflationary decade compared to the earlier decade that is more uh, you know disinflationary and, and deleveraging oriented. So let's move on to this next one, uh, next chart, which is broad money and CPI. Yeah, one of the one of the you know big correlations is that you know in in most countries, broad money supply per capita is one of the more correlated variables to CPI increases. Uh, and basically, you know, when there's more money circulating in, in the in the economy at a faster pace, uh, prices are likely to rise. And there are there are some exceptions. It's not always kind of a one to one correlation. And so, for example, in the late 1800s in the United States. Uh, we had a, a bigger gap between those numbers than most other countries because we had, you know, the, basically the, the the open continent and, and you know, large populations coming, uh, you know, basically cheap land, uh, you know, just dis they displaced the natives and there's, you know, the whole history there. Uh, plus, you had the Industrial Revolution. So you had a bunch of new technologies that were, you know, uh, the good type of technological deflation. Uh, and the same thing, you know, kind of in the, in the, in the you know, the, the, uh, the 2000s and the 2010s. Where you know you had the internet, you had mobile phones, you, you basically got rid of a bunch of devices, combined them into a smartphone. You had offshoring, you had automation, uh, and so there are some periods of time where you can have a, a, a disconnect between money supply growth and CPI. But in general, they they are are, are rather correlated, especially among multiple countries. Uh, and so what we saw over the past you know 18 months is that we saw a pretty sharp increase in broad money supply. And that at least opens up the the strong possibility for a, a CPI spike of, of some magnitude, which uh, is which is something we've seen, right? So far, yeah. I mean, you know, broad money supply is up. You know, th the chart shows that in general, money supply goes up faster than CPI, uh, but that you know, when you have that big spike in in money supply, uh, you know, that opens up a, a decent chance for a spike in CPI. And so, when money supply goes up, uh, you know, twenty five percent year over year, as it has. We shouldn't be shocked if we start seeing, you know, some CPI numbers in in the, you know, at least the mid single digits, uh, you know, at least, you know, on a, on a temporary basis. Uh, and why don't we talk just briefly while we're on the subject of CPI of the base over, you know, the base effects, the year over year effects that uh, should be obvious to everyone, but they somehow still seem to surprise <laughs> lots of folks. Yeah, that's one of those things that I've been covering in my report because. You know, I wanted to get in front of the narrative because I knew that once we saw some some you know headline CPI numbers, that people would be misinterpreting them, and so it's it's one of those things where, you know, I was pointing out that we have a good probability of having say a three percent CPI print 
uh, in the in this you know this cycle. And so basically, you know, last year in the April and May time frame, that was kind of the worst part of the lockdowns. And so that was like the, the dip we had in CPI. That was the most disinflationary period. And when you compare April 2021 to April 2020 uh, and that year over year, uh, you know, percent increase, you're bound to get a bigger percent increase because you're comparing to a very weak period. You have easy, easy comps. Right. Uh, and so that's basically part of the inflation, uh, you know, thing that we're seeing. However, uh, you know, it, basically inflation came in hotter than, than economists were expecting, and the month-over-month month increases uh, were very significant, and those are not really impacted by the base effects. And so when you have the combination of, you know, the, the easy base effects, which can add, you know, a percent or a percent and a half to the number, and then you also have, you know, true price, price increases and fiscal-driven uh, reflation – that's where we get some of these these numbers that are kind of surprisingly high to some people. Do you think we're going to have another uh, surprising uh, kind of month ahead of us or even a couple I th- months? I think there's a good chance because if you look at the base effects, uh, the May numbers, uh, which will be reported in June, uh, you know, that they, they're also very easy base effects. Uh, and some of the some of the wage pressures that we're seeing uh, here uh, in May, you know, weren't yet recorded in those April numbers that we just got a couple days ago. And so I do think some of the main numbers reported in June will also be pretty hot. And so I think it's one of those things where, you know, eventually this will cool off. But the question is from what level? I think, you know, as we go into this late spring, early summer period, uh, I think these, some of these numbers, you know, the combination of base effects and actual price increases, uh, you know, give you some pretty hot numbers. Uh, just to put you on the spot, do you think the Fed's going to be able to look through it and say it's transi- transitory or do you think that they're going to cry uncle? I think at least for these next few months, I think they're gonna they're gonna stick to the transitory theme. They're you're, they're not gonna they're not gonna even give the Wall Street a little bit. And and so then the next question is, does Wall Street throw a fit? Does the curve steepen and does it get ugly? I think it could. I mean, you saw a little bit of that earlier, uh, you know, in the past few months, and that cooled off because the you know basically you know in in the FOMC releases. Uh, you know, I think Jay Powell's been making it clear that they don't want to move until they see it and for a sta- sustained period of time. And so I think that I think the Fed's going to play the transitory card uh, for as long as they can. And now they might around the margins start, you know, say, reducing asset purchases a little bit. Uh, and and so I, I think they because they're, you know, in many ways, they're already very loose, like they have zero interest rates. They have one hundred twenty billion in, in monthly purchases, you know, I, basically they have a lot of room to pull that back before they do anything that would be considered in any other context to be hawkish, like race, like raising rates, you know, half percent or something like that. Right. And so Stanley Druckenmiller, the uh, famed uh, hedge fund manager, came out and cr- openly criticized the Fed. Do you sh- share his sentiment? Uh, so I think it's one of those, you know, one of the, the things I've been saying for a while is that I, th- I think in some ways they painted themselves in a corner. And so some of their actions back, you know, in the 90s and things like that really kind of set this course, uh, you know, basically helped all this debt build up in the first place. And so once this debt is as high as it is, uh, it's really, really hard to unwind. And so I keep saying that, you know, one of the one of the worst jobs I want to have is is central banker because, <laughs> you know, with with, say, federal debt as high as it is, uh, you know, and, and, and so much leverage in the system, it shows how hard tightening is. I mean, when Jay Powell tried to tighten uh, back in, you know, uh, 2018, uh, you know, he wasn't able to get very far before, you know, the market started to fall apart. And not just the stock market, but also the the credit market, which in, which in many ways is more important. Uh, and so, yeah, basically, they're they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And that's what characterizes the end of a long term debt cycle, where even when they get inflation, they still don't really have the capacity to tighten too much. I think that's a great way of putting it, Lynn. I've always said that the last um, the the real last chance we had to tighten and to be responsible was the 1996 irrational exuberance speech by um, Greenspan. And exactly. At that, I, exactly. Oh, sorry, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Because I think that was the, the at that point um, we were just starting to experience the the kind of labor shock. And he went and chose to let rates go lower than they should have been. And by doing so, put into, you know, created all the huge levering that we're seeing for the next few decades. And every time since then, it's been more and more difficult to do. And I completely agree with you that there's no way where they're going to get religion now. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it started with the, you know, the 1987 Fed put, and then it, it was basically went over the event horizon in the 90s. And then ever since then, it's, you know, it's they're, they're between a rock and a hard place. And, 
you know, it's it's one of those things where I still think that there's certain things they could do differently, uh, but that overall they they're, they're kind of don't have a ton of choices. Yeah, it's all it's all set, and 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 it's set because of these grand credit cycles that you're talking about. Okay, so let's go to the next chart here, which is private sector loans, government deficit, broad money, year over year growth. Yeah, so basically, there's you know when we, we so if we if we look at how correlated broad money supply is with CPI, uh, that you know especially because other countries are even more closely related historically. Uh, we can then say, okay, wh- why does money supply go up or down? And there's really two main levers uh, that are that are that make that happen. And so one is, you know, the, the primary one is loan growth. And so when banks make loans, uh, that creates new deposits, uh, and so you get broad money supply growth. And so there are certain periods of history, like the late 1800s uh, and like you know the 50s and the 60s, uh, where you have very strong loan growth, and that's what's driving is private sector credit creation. Uh, there are other decades where uh, the the M2 supply it goes up a lot because of government deficits, and so you basically are going around the banking system uh, and just spending into the economy. And so that's what we saw. If you look at the inflation in the 1940s, for example, uh, loan growth was not very high at all. So that's the blue line on that on that on that chart with the black background. Uh, whereas uh, government deficits were the were the biggest we ever had, and that's what drove the money supply growth. Where the you know. The federal government, you know, spends a lot of money into the economy. They issue bonds, and then the central bank buys a significant percentage of those bonds with new base money. And so, basically, you have a rapid increase in broad money supply that's not uh, loan-driven. Whereas 1970s inflation was a very different environment because, uh, you know, in some ways you did have rising deficits there towards the end of the decade, uh, but it was, you know, pr- primarily a loan-driven. Uh, inflation, where you know banks are making a lot of loans, uh, and then of course you had commodity shocks and things like that, and so it's you know it's basically important to understand the levers that are involved, uh, you know that that's behind why inflation is happening. So that's fascinating. And this next chart, which is showing fiscal spending versus QE alone, and I guess you're really contrasting the the difference between the great financial crisis and this current crisis. Yeah, and this is on this is on uh, page three in the slide deck. Uh, and so that that's basically what shows, you know, when you have these kind of one-two punch in the end of a long-term debt cycle. So you have the private debt bubble uh, collapse, and then later you have the public, you know, the, the public debt bubble. And so when you know, a lot of people thought that that you know, bank balance sheet, uh, central bank balance sheets going vertical uh, a decade ago would have been inflationary. But this chart shows, in, in many ways, why that was not. And so the the red lines on that chart show the year-over-year change in the in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Uh, and the the blue line is the year over year change in the broad money supply, uh, and then the green line is is government transfer payments. And so what we saw back in the in the you know the 2008 to 2014 periods of quantitative easing is that you saw you know uh, uh, the central bank balance sheet went up a lot, uh, but that just recapitalized the banking system. You know they 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 created new base money, uh, they bought assets from the banks, so they they filled banks up with with cash. Uh, but that didn't get out into the broad money supply because banks were making a lot of loans, uh, and uh, the fiscal deficits, were, you know, as large as they were, they were just kind of offsetting some of the loan losses, so they weren't very big. Whereas here, what we saw in, in 2020 and then the early part of 2021 with the second round of fiscal, is that uh, it's not just QE this time. You have you have quantitative easing, but then you also have you know all of these uh, you know, government transfer payments in the, in the form of stimulus checks, unemployment benefits. PPP loans that turn into grants, you know, state benefits, things like that, and so that actually gets out that money into the broad money supply. And so, you know, it's not just QE; it's the combination of the government spending into the economy, issuing bonds, and then the central bank creating new base money and buying those bonds on the secondary market. And so, basically, it's, it's going around the bank lending system and getting money directly into the the money supply. And now this next chart, we finally get back to my 1940s versus 1970s. And so why don't you walk us through how these two cycles went and then contrast it to today's? Yeah, so on slide on slide four here, uh, we see that you know, there, there, you know the past century had two big inflationary periods, and those were the 1940s and the 1970s. And the Fed uh, responded in two totally opposite ways uh, to those inflationary periods. Uh, which which made sense in the historical concept because they had two very different types of causes, uh, and so if you look at the 1970s, uh, you know as we said before, that was a very loan-driven inflation where you know you had a lot of bank lending, uh, you also had pretty significant uh, fiscal deficits, uh, and so money supply was rising pretty rapidly, uh, and 
you know, one of the ways that the Federal Reserve tried to contain inflation is they started raising rates and trying to tighten. Uh, and, and they were generally slow to do so. So they never really got ahead of it. They just kind of kept up with it until you had Volcker come in at the end. Right. Uh, and so as we see in that chart there, uh, you know, the blue line is, is year over year CPI. The red line is, uh, you know, three month uh, T-bill rate, which is a good proxy for short term interest rates. Uh, and so, you know, they, they were raising rates along with inflation trying to contain it. Uh, and it took them a while to do so. Uh, and the reason they were able to do that is, you know, uh, uh, both federal debt as a percentage of GDP and private debt as a percentage of GDP were both very low. And so they could actually raise rates pretty high without causing, you know, giant insolvencies in the system. And because the inflation was very loan driven, they had a reason to believe that that tightening w- would help fix that. Whereas the 1940s in many ways were totally the opposite. So federal debt was very, very high, which makes raising interest rates difficult because then you're, you know, then you're, you're, the federal interest expense is, is extraordinarily high, and so that that causes kind of fiscal insolvency issues. Uh, but then, two, because the inflation was fiscally driven rather than loan driven, uh, you know, they did they just they just capped interest rates at zero, you know, pretty much for the course of that decade. And so, even when inflation ran hot, uh, they didn't they didn't you know they were not quick to move. Uh, you know, even when you got you know past that whole period, really a decade of these of these transient inflation spikes and broad money supply growth and and you know, inflation at some point would hit double digits year over year, uh, and they still held tight. Uh, they still held loose. I mean, because you know, it, this it's not loan-driven inflation; it's fiscal-driven, and because you know, when the federal debt is a hundred percent of GDP, uh, they can't really afford to raise interest rates too much because then you start to have kind of a uh, kind of a death spiral, similar to what we we started to see play out in, in the eurozone a decade ago. So if we go to slide five, we'll see how it's playing out today in the 2020s for the current uh, inflation spike. Yeah, so far we're starting to play out like the 40s, which is which has been my base case for a while, where we're going to see you know uh, these kind of periodic inflationary events, and you know how big they get or how many they are will largely depend on on fiscal decisions that are hard to predict ahead of time. Uh, but at least we're seeing this this you know this first one play out. Where you have you know an, an, a big you know inflationary outcome, some of its base effects, some of its you know actual inflation, uh, but then either way, the Fed's kind of looking at that and saying, no, this is this is fiscally driven, this is temporary, uh, this is transitory, and so we're going to hold rates low uh, and kind of let that let that play out. And so that's in many ways, people when they think of inflation, they naturally think of the 70s, whereas in many ways the 1940s are a better way to think of this, in my view. Uh, as it relates to to multiple asset classes and and what's likely to happen during this decade. I guess this is down to that whole problem that many investors have in terms of understanding that the fiscal is what's really driving the bus. And I guess part of the problem is that we've had four decades of monetary being all the the be all and end all in terms of trying to forecast economic growth. And now all of a sudden we're seeing it with this back to fiscal dominance as you so well, you know, correctly named it, and, and and people are having trouble making that switch. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, people trading today just weren't around for it, and so it's it's one of those things where going into history books and looking at kind of uh, bottlenecks in the system is is kind of the the cheat code for for seeing what they're doing. And it's you know, you can never you can never say perfectly what's going to happen. You, the closest you can do is say, you know. Here's a framework I'm using, which in, in my case is the long-term debt cycle that I that I, I, I kind of picked up from Ray Dalio, and I see these things playing out, and I see all the evidence building, and I say, okay, you know, it's I, I often use the quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. I don't even know if he said it or not, but it's like history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Right. And so it's saying, okay, we're not saying it's going to be identical to the 40s. There's, there's a bunch of ways it's different, different demographics. Uh, the United States, you know, it's a different monetary system, so. Uh, you know, we have a structural trade deficit instead of a surplus like that. And so there, there are a bunch of differences under the surface, but at least in terms of fiscal monetary policy, uh, in many ways, the, the 2020s are shaping up like that decade. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a small number of analysts that are kind of, you know, covering that topic pretty thoroughly, including, for example, you've had Luke Groman on your show, I believe. He's one of the ones that's been making that comparison a lot. So, Lynn, um you know, you're, you're, you're young and, and you weren't around and when all these things happen yet, you seem to be the most knowledgeable economist out there in terms of understanding this, your uh, kind of weekend reading must be just tons of fun. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's trying to piece together like old data sets. And, like, uh, you know. So where do you go? Like, how do you walk me through how you figure these things out? I, I've, I've looked kind of briefly at some of your footnotes and they, they look like some pretty dry reading. Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, I guess I'm just, I'm always been very numbers oriented. So I, I kind of like, I get excited when I find like old data sets that I can put into Excel and, and kind of play around with. And so, uh, you know, I, it's basically like really old documents from the census bureau where they, where they go back to the 1800s, uh, or like really old, you know, federal reserve documents, or, uh, you know, there's this one, uh, set from a couple of professors that put together data sets. Also, Robert Schiller has a, you know, different yeah, data sets. He's got go a back great one for sure. Yeah. And so it's kind of like this finding out kind of the different strengths and weaknesses of some of those data sets and kind of trying to find interesting outcomes that happened. Oh, no, you put together some great stuff in terms of really making it so people can understand the kind of uh, the economy and how it works over a longer period. Because I think this is the problem that a lot of investors are faced with. We've been in a period of monetary dominance, like you say, and we're moving to fiscal and understanding that change is, is so important. So let's go on to the next slide here, slide six, where you ask the question, is inflation transitory? Yeah, so that's the big topic right now is that, you know, it's, it's undeniable that we're having some degree of inflation. And the big question is how transitory will it be? And one of the things I've been trying to separate, because uh, I don't see a lot of people separating the two concepts, is that there's transitory in absolute terms uh, versus transitory in rate of change terms. Okay. Uh, and, and so transitory in absolute terms means that, you know, say there's some sort of dis uh, supply disruption, like a, a, a boat gets stuck in the canal or whatever, and we can't get things and prices go up temporarily. And whenever that is resolved, uh, prices come back down, right? right? So we had, a, we had a weird kind of outcome. We temporarily had higher prices, then came back down. Uh, that would be transitory inflation. That's basically not, you know, it's not quote unquote real inflation. Uh, whereas if you have, you know, uh, uh, inflation goes up a lot, uh, so the rate of change of, of CPI increase is, is going up pretty dramatically, you know, four, five, six percent or whatever. Uh, and then eventually it just cools off and, and goes back down to, you know, two or three uh, percent, but never, never deflates, never goes back down. Uh, basically, what you had in that event was you had a permanent price increase. Uh, and and the, the, the thing that was transitory was the rate of change of that uh, uh, outcome. And so. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, are, isn't it pretty clear, though, that, that we're not going to go back down and, and that, that the Fed is incorrect when they say it's transitory? I, I think so. And I think basically, it, you know, I think they're going to be correct that it's you know partially transitory in rate of change terms, uh, but not in absolute terms. And I think they're aware of that. I, so, you know, when I when I so these charts here show, again, the 1940s. And on the left, you see that's, you know, year over year CPI. So what we know as, you know, price inflation and you can see that deflation came in three really big waves. I mean, they, you know, as as the war went on, you had different shortages, you had price and wage controls, uh, and so there were periods of time where you got these big inflation spikes. Uh, but then after the inflation spikes, it would it would cool off, but you would never really get a, a big deflation that took prices back down. And so if you look on the chart on the right, that's just the absolute CPI level, and you would see that you know you'd have this you'd have this increase in prices, and then it would just hit a new plateau. And it would just that's it would level off, you know, it'd be tr it would be truly transitory in rate of change terms, right. but not in absolute terms. And then would, you'd have another leg up in prices, and it would kind of level off again, and then another leg up. And so that's how I'm modeling what we're seeing here in the 2020s, where you know we're seeing this current leg up in prices, uh, but I think you know even after this this period cools off, it's not as though prices are going to go back down. I mean, you know, some certain specific types of prices, uh, for example, I think lumber is going to come back down. Uh, but when you look at a, a broad sample of, you know, when you see Procter & Gamble raising their prices, when you see Coca-Cola raising their prices, when you see Chipotle increasing the, you know, the low end of the wage they play, uh, you know, I think when you see, say, copper, for example, I think uh, most of these things are not going to retrace uh, back to the price level they started this at. That it's 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 transitory in rate of change terms, meaning we're, we're not going to get, you know, necessarily stuck in a high degree of year-over-year -year inflation, but that whatever inflation we do get, because it's accompanied by so much money supply growth in the system, rather than just uh, supply bottlenecks, that those prices stay, you know, some degree elevated compared to where they where they were. Yeah, it's almost like the Fed's saying it's transitory, wink, wink. Okay, so we've lots to chew on there in terms of what's happening to the uh, kind of economy. Now let's take it to the markets and what this means for your portfolio. Slide seven, you go through your equity rotations. And this is a theme you've been on for a long time. It's been a terrific trade. And you mentioned this the last time you were on, but it's only gotten better why don't you tell us what you're thinking in terms of value versus growth and uh, kind of small versus big and all that kind of stuff? 
Yeah, and so this, you know, this is this is something I, I think I even brought this up on the first time I was on your show in, in last year, and it's just the you know, so one the one on the left there is equal weight versus uh, market weight S P five hundred, and so it's the same five hundred companies and they're just weighted differently. Uh, and so what's interesting is if you look at data from so from you know either Y charts here or I have another uh, data set from Wilshire that goes back another decade that over the long run uh, large cap equal weight outperforms uh, large cap market weight uh, and it's because it, it kind of has a value uh, slant you're kind of leading leaning away from whatever's expensive and kind of leading into what's kind of you know, doing poorly and then there's periods of, of, of rotation and so what this generally shows is that in the early part of a business cycle usually the equal weight uh, uh, index does better as you have some degree of, of leadership rotation. And then as you get into the later part of a business cycle, usually the, the market weight underperforms. And so that would be, you know, the, the line going down on this chart, meaning that, you know, the, the, the ones that are kind of in the mega caps that are at the top of the index kind of, you know, outperform from there until you have a recession and some sort of catalyst that pushes things back, like a different fiscal monetary regime they kind of push things back in the other, other direction. I, I, Lynn, I, I love this chart. I, I've been on this for a while. I think it's one of the few um, kind of anomalies that smaller investors can take advantage of. The reason that you can't go and get a large uh, investor that's uh, you know going to move the market to do this strategy is because they need the liquidity of the larger cap stocks. So they, by in almost kind of definition, need to go and do you know. Uh, market, you know, cap weighted indexes, but the small investor can take care, you know, take advantage of this. And then the other thing that I found is the drawdowns periods are too large for professional money managers to sit through. You know, when yeah, you when yeah. you look at this over the long period, there's periods, you know, of maybe one, two, three years where equal weight underperforms, you know, market cap and market weight indexes. And therefore, if you're sitting there and you're a money manager, you can't afford to take that kind of, of uh, kind of drawdown. Yet as an individual investor with a long term horizon, this is one of the f few free lunches out there, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And it's really, you know, it's it, it really works in large cap because. So if you do equal weight, you have to have a way of filtering out the losers, like the permanent losers. Right. Uh, and so if you had, say, a, a small cap one, it'd be hard to filter out the ones that are that are kind of permanently doing bad, uh, because there's, you know, it, it, say they're still in the index. Whereas if you're if you're limiting it to say the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000, uh, you know, you're, you're you're kind of equally weighting them. But you still have some sort of quality filter where if they if they permanently start to be to be bad investments, like let's say they're just on the wrong side of technology or whatever, they eventually get replaced from the index. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of rotating the things that are that are cheap, but that are not yet fundamentally broken. That's a great point. And for those who are interested, the symbol for the U.S. Uh, equal weight one is RSP. And go, to, you know, go to look at the research on that because it is, as I say, if you're willing to sit through some drawdowns, it is probably one of the few free lunches out there. Okay, the next one is the value versus growth. Yeah, so whenever this line's going up, it means value is outperforming, and whenever it's going down, it means growth is outperforming. Uh, and so, you know, this one doesn't doesn't follow the same cycles as the as the equal weight versus market weight, but it tends to have inflection points around the same time. And so. You know, we've, we've in many ways that the past five years looked a lot like the second half of the 1990s, where you had such a such a dominant period of growth stocks outperforming value stocks. And of course, you also had back then a strong dollar. Uh, you had, uh, you know, weak commodity prices. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, we in many ways, we had a replay of that from 20 years ago. And ever since we got the vaccine announcements uh, and and some of the fiscal response and all that kind of starting in that in that mid to, to later 2020 period, we've seen a pretty strong rotation towards value, uh, where you know energy stocks that were totally beaten up uh, bounce back, and industrials and, and banks and things like that, uh, whereas some of the really high flying uh, tech stocks started to to underperform, even though their underlying fundamentals were still fine. It's just that the multiples that investors were willing to pay for them really cooled off. And so I, I still think there's a good chance that this that this rotation, even though it won't go up in a straight line, it'll have kind of choppy pullbacks along the way. I still think we're somewhat early innings uh, for some of these value sectors doing pretty well. Oh, Lynn, I could, couldn't agree more. The question I have for you is, is this something you see going on for years and maybe even a decade? I think I think there's a good chance it can go on for, for five years or more, uh, but it's, you know, it's kind of like you have to keep monitoring the health of that outlook. And right. so 
if I start to see things that say otherwise, you know, I, I could change my opinion. If, if for example, we 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 rather, you know, if, if the fiscal disappeared uh, to know, overnight and they went back to trying to balance budgets. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there's certain levels I'm watching. And, and for example, I've also been kind of tracking a, uh, you know, we've had a period, a decade of U.S. outperforming other other markets. And I've been kind of looking for a rotation there. And that one has been slower than these two, okay. for example, where where we haven't really kind of had continued outperformance, but we haven't really had underperformance either. It's kind of been ever since kind of middle of last year, we've been kind of in an unclear you know, process. Uh, walk us through why you're looking for maybe the U.S. to start underperforming the rest of the world. Uh, so one is that if you were to have so if you so the, on this value versus growth uh, chart, uh, if you were to look at an international version, you'd see a similar thing where you know international value is outperforming international growth, and in general, uh, you know U.S. markets are tilted towards growth sectors. Okay. Uh, and so if you were to have a broad sustained value uh, cycle. Uh, then some of those value-oriented indices could do better. Uh, and then second of all, you know, going back to our petrodollar discussion, we've had a really big period of the U.S. running giant trade deficits and then uh, those other countries taking those dollars and, and then reinvesting them back into to U.S. assets. And so we, we've, we've, you know, the whole world's kind of overweight U.S. at the current time. Uh, and so uh, that also kind of ties into because we're having a more aggressive fiscal response uh, combined with you know fairly loose monetary response, even though it's not quite the loosest monetary response, it's it's still pretty loose in, in the grand scheme of things. Where I think there's a decent chance that we're in a dollar bear cycle, uh, that the dollar peaked back in you know you can either call it that peak back in 2016 or that second peak back in early 2020, uh, and then I think the dollar is on on kind of a more bearish trend, uh, similar to similarly to what we saw in the early 2000s, uh, where we had kind of a, a pro commodity cycle. A pro-emerging market cycle, uh, and so that's that's kind of a trend that I'm monitoring. Uh, and you know, there, again, there's certain levels I'm looking for because you know, until it breaks, you know, say the dollar index breaks below 88, it doesn't really get that interesting. Okay. Uh, you know, but overall, it's something that I'm kind of, you know, kind of have in the back of my mind as like a base case that I that I you know I'm kind of slowly watching to see if it plays out. Speaking of the U.S. dollar bear market potentially, you know, unfolding in front of us, you, one of the things that's happened over the last few uh, weeks, I guess, is that you become a little more sympathetic or, you know, warming up to our little gold. And I'm going to read something you wrote recently. As, as I've been covering for about four to six weeks now, I think there's a good probability that the low for gold is in after an eight-month correction. Inflation looks to run hot here, and I don't think that rates will keep up, which would result in lower yields, if true. We'll see. I continue to like gold stocks here as well at current gold price levels. Back in the early, uh, during the early 2000s, gold bull run, gold miners had high input costs and did a lot of destructive overpriced acquisitions, which destroyed capital and made them over leveraged with little or no free cash flow generation. Many of the CEOs of that era were replaced during the subsequent 2020, 2010s bear market in the industry. Now, after a lot of reform, we see many gold stocks that are generating free cash flow with a focus on create, uh, controlling costs and only doing selective acquisitions. One of the th uh, companies that you highlight on page eight or slide eight is Barrick Gold. Why don't you tell us why that's one of your picks? Sure. Yeah. Going back to, to gold for a second, you know, ever since uh, real rates bottomed back in August 2020, uh, gold has been in a correction. Uh, and so, you know, gold's closest correlation, you know, it goes up over the time with broad money supply and, and things like that. Uh, but, the, you know, the rate of change that it moves is largely tied to, to real rates, which which can be measured in a couple ways. Uh, but, you know, it is, is you know, most easily measured in, in the 10 year treasury minus 10 uh, year break even rates. Uh, and uh, and so that, you know, that hit a bottom of like negative one point oh eight percent in August 2020. And ever since the 10 year treasury started rising, uh, you know, that that rose faster than inflation expectations for several months. Uh, and so you basically had rates that were real rates that were still negative, uh, but they were less negative than they were. Okay. Uh, and so the, basically the euphoria that, that happened in the summer of 2020 for gold kind of rolled over and we had this long correction and then we had all sorts of other narratives around it. Uh, but it's something I continue to track and I continue to be, you know, to be long them, but just, you know, kind of just watching that trend play out. And then starting in late March, I started to say, okay, actually we're seeing some signs of, of real rates kind of rolling over. Uh, and then, you know, gold kind of uh, bottoming a little bit. And then when you take into account the base effects, some of the reflationary effects that we, we could, you know, kind of see coming up here in April and May, it has looked overall like the risk reward was getting back on gold side. 
Uh, but then even even gold at current prices uh, is actually a pretty good environment for a lot of gold miners uh, and gold royalty companies uh, because you know it's, it's profitable enough that they, you know they're making good profits on their on their assets. And then unlike the gold spike in 2011, you know back then they you know they had high input costs, so energy costs were very high. Uh, and they also were just, you know, poorly managed. They were doing a lot of destructive acquisitions and things like that. And so they managed to have that, you know, gold literally ran from the the lower, you know, like, let's say $300 an ounce all the way up to, you know, as high as it got. Uh, and yet you still saw that gold miners were barely making any free cash flow, <laughs> which is it's kind of a miracle to, to it was, mess up it was that all, It was all going into CEO's pockets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so if you look at, at the chart on the left there on, on slide eight, that's Barrett Gold. Uh, it's one of the, the major gold companies, and, and basically those green areas are free cash flow, uh, and 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 the black line is the stock price. And so what you saw is that you know you were you they weren't very free cash flow you know positive, even though gold prices were doing great. Uh, and so and this was this is true if you look at you know it wasn't just Barrick, it was across the industry. Uh, and so after gold after gold had that big bear market into you know 2015, uh, and you know basically companies just rode that up and they just destroyed capital. A lot of CEOs got replaced. A lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, changes happened. And they started to, you know, focus more on profitability where they say, okay, we're going to try to reduce costs as much as possible. We're not going to do aggressive capital expenditures. Uh, we're going to try to make sure that we're, we're profitable even at pretty low gold prices. And so with Barrick there, you started to see that they started to generate a consistent amount of free cash flow. And uh, they also used that free cash flow to pay down debts. So if you were to look at Barrick's balance sheet, it went from, you know, pretty bad back in 2015 to, you know, beautiful today where they have almost as much cash as debt. And it's not just the gold miners that are, you know, paying down debt and, and being more disciplined. I, I think you're also have a theme of watching the energy companies. Yeah, we've been seeing that play out in the energy companies. And so, you know, to some extent, the, the large oil majors, you know, they, they generally have been usually free cash flow positive, but the, the smaller producers and especially the shale producers, They've been, you know, they did the same thing that gold companies did, where they just put, you know, they just took a bunch of external capital and they just plowed it into the ground. They never really focused on being free cash flow positive. Uh, and then when eventually gold just, I mean, when it, when oil just collapses, they basically had nothing to show for it over the past decade. Uh, and then when you combine that with ESG concerns, uh, you know, overall there's just not a lot of investor appetite for issuing them all sorts of equity and debt. And so a lot of them are forced to you know, focus more on free cash flow and to basically, you know, self-fund more of their operations from making profits. Uh, and go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you, you know, you, you've you highlighted on, on the slide eight e, uh, enterprise product partners. Is, is that one of the ones that your favorite picks in this sector? Yeah, that's a that's a pipeline business. And I, I brought it up in, in, I think, one of the previous uh, interviews we did. And so one thing we saw is if you looked at, you know, the past 25 years or so, there was a rapid build out of, of pipeline infrastructure across North America. Uh, and, you know, that industry was never free cash flow positive. They would, they, you know, it was the MLP structure. So they would constantly issue new units. Uh, so basically constantly raise new equity and debt from the, from the public uh, and then put that into assets. And so they basically, you know, would pay off older investors with newer investors. Uh, and and they, they were able to keep that going for a couple decades. Uh, but when oil prices fell, uh, you know, five or six years ago, and, and that rate of, of shale growth kind of rolled over, a lot of those companies were caught flat-footed. They, they were not ready for that. Uh, and so some of the poorly managed ones blew up. I mean, they, they had to cut their dividends. Uh, you know, they had, to, they had all sorts of issues. And there were some really well-managed ones like Enterprise that, that kind of saw that coming. And so they kind of tapered that ahead of time where they never, they never got too indebted to begin with. Uh, and they started to reduce their uh, distribution payout ratio, so they, they they gradually become more self-funding, uh, and so they didn't really implode the way that other ones imploded. Uh, and but overall, you know, we see that they you know they never used to be a very free cash flow positive enterprise, uh, but then now you know they're very they're very focused on being self-funding. They're not issuing new units. Uh, they're actually they have a buyback authorization, which you know basically the, the whole point of an MLP structure is kind of designed to to create new units. Uh, but they're actually willing to buy back units uh, and basically just self-fund any capex they need uh, through actual free cash flow generation, and so that's something we're seeing, uh, you know, in some of the smaller producers as well as these these pipeline transport companies, where the you know just due to ESG concerns, 
uh, and due to you know a lot of the other ones just failing to produce good returns, they were seeing a, a much more disciplined industry. Uh, and that is that is you know it, it's it's good for forward returns, and it also kind of uh, puts limits on on how much oil supply can come to market uh, over the next several years. Um, speaking of oil supply, this last chart, slide nine, you talk about the oil cycle. What are you trying to show us here? Uh, so that blue line is the five-year rolling price change uh, for oil uh, on the right axis, and then I also just have the five-year rolling CPI change uh, in orange. Uh, and that just shows kind of the long-term uh, oil price cycle that it goes through. And it's, you know, I think it's Rick Rule that said, you know, uh, in, in natural resources, uh, bull markets are the authors of bear markets, and bear markets are the author of bull markets. Where, you know, you, when you when you have when prices are high, uh, you know, there's tons of incentive to to you know create new supply of it, uh, and that of course you know results in oversupply. And then you have a period of low prices, and nobody wants to invest in the space, and and capex keeps going down. Uh, and eventually demand, you know, kind of catches back up and outpaces supply and prices start to rise and that causes the next cycle to start. And so, you know, this has basically been a you know perfect storm for oil over the past five or six years. Uh, and so it's been a really terrible industry. It, it kind of, you know, killed a lot of the excess. It punished uh, bad investments. Uh, but going forward, now that the industry's kind of, you know, kind of right sized itself uh, and when we're seeing just lower capex spending uh, and when we see just uh, big pools of capital, uh, you know, kind of divest from that space due to ESG concerns. Uh, overall, I think that's it's it, it's probably a better decade ahead for oil uh, than the you know the past five or six years that it's that it's gone through. And and what is this chart? This global primary energy consumption by s- source. Uh, I I see coal rising. Like and that was actually kind of surprising. I haven't seen this in in a long time. This chart. I actually would have thought coal would have already been down more than that, but it doesn't seem to be. What are you trying to show there? One of the points on this chart, so this chart goes back 200 years, and it just shows that whenever humans use a new energy source, uh, historically it just added on to the previous source. We never actually stopped using whatever prior source we were using. And so we, you know, we had wood and then, you know, and, and other biomass, and then we found coal. And so we added that, but we never we never stopped burning wood. We just, we <laughs> That's just added to fascinating. It. I had no idea. Who burns wood still? Uh, well, it's you know it's it's wood stoves and and things like that. There's also it's also it's just people out uh, in the country burning. The, yeah. Wow. And it's also you know population grows over the time as well. And so even though biomass is a much smaller percentage of energy usage in absolute terms, it stayed steady because population around the world grew. Uh, and so that also incru- includes you know uh, people people burn uh, all sorts of fuel sources in in say India for example and some of those so South South Asian uh, countries. Where they, they burn cow dung, and that's also considered traditional biomass. <laughs> there you go, something we didn't know. Okay, Lynn, um, why don't you tell us where you think the market might be the most surprised next year? Any, any you know, in any way, and it doesn't, you know, something you think the market is convinced of that you think there's a better chance than the market realizes that something else will happen. I think that the market is associating inflation with industry hikes. And I don't think the market's ready for the the divide that we could experience over the next couple of years between these these waves of inflation that happen versus the Fed just kind of holding interest rates at a low level. And so I don't I don't know if it if it, if it sees how low real rates could get uh, and how long they could stay there. Uh, and then the other thing that might just be that you know when energy eventually picks back up. I mean you know big big drivers of energy include China and India and other countries like that, uh, where combined with the low capex. Uh, that you know this this period of over like overabundance of oil, I think the next few years could turn into tighter oil markets than than people expect. And what would be the ramifications of more negative real rates than the market expects? Uh, so overall, that would be pretty good for gold in most environments. I mean, gold's closest correlation is is with real rates, and so that's that's generally a great environment for gold. Uh, it's you know it's it's pretty bad for for people that are holding bonds or cash okay. uh, because you're you're getting paid you know let's say you have cash in the bank you're getting paid zero while inflation's four uh, percent so you're basically losing purchasing power uh, and it also I mean that's generally decent for uh, you know uh, uh, value oriented sectors like banks or or you know these energy pipeline companies and things like that uh, whereas that could still continue to put pressure on on some of the growth stocks. So here's another question I'll kind of pepper you with, Lynn. Uh, what is your favorite investing book? Favorite investing book? 
I think I'd have to go. I think I learned the most from lessons of history, which is not even an investing book, but it just it like summarizes five thousand years of human history in like a hundred pages. <laughs> and that and it has a couple chapters on economics that go into, for example, these long term debt cycles. And you know, one of the things I like to point out is that there's a passage about uh, ancient Greece. It was like 2,600 years ago, and it's basically them going through a long-term debt cycle. And it's so funny because if you were to just take that paragraph and put like today's modern modern politicians' names on it, it's like I, literally identical to what's playing out now. <laughs> so is this the and, book by uh, Ariel Durant and Durant? Yes. Oh, that's great. I had no idea. Okay, the final question for you, Lynn. If you could go meet the Lynn of, I don't know, you're so young, I'll, I'll go with 10 years ago. 10 years ago, before you were the Twitter phenomenon, the uh, economic uh, all-star, what advice would you give her? Mm, probably to, to be less conservative with making changes, uh, just because I, 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 you know, I tend to, to be, I try to hold on to the status quo longer than I should sometimes. Uh, and, and kind of you know make changes slowly or be more hesitant to make changes and kind of stick to the safer path. And so I might might say to you know be, be more willing to kind of be more aggressive with things rather than wait until all the pieces are in line before kind of moving and, and be more flexible in that regard. You're, you're like a true engineer. Okay, so listen, um, why don't you tell people where they can find your service? I I, I I'm a big fan. I I subscribe. Give them the whole spiel of where they can go and uh, learn more about you and sign up for your terrific newsletter. Uh, so I'm at lindalton.com, and I, I have a lot of free materials there. Like I have a free newsletter and, and public articles, uh, and then I also have a low-cost uh, paid research service that comes out more frequently and, and covers some of these more tactical things in the market. Okay, so there you go, lindalton.com. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. Yep, thanks for having me. Always happy to be here. Okay, Patrick, it's time for Talking Charts. Interesting week. What do you have in store for us? Well, before we get to actually charts, let's talk about those things we were watching last week, right? And uh, we were watching that U.S. dollar and uh, and how the, it was playing out. And really, uh, we did get uh, a breakdown, and it just remains so weak um, that, that there's no sign of a, a U.S. dollar strength at all. But what's interesting is that it's at a major support line. And so the only thing you could really lean on is this idea that this kind of 89, 90 level where all these lows came in earlier in the year could hold. But U U.S. dollar remains really weak. Any comment on that? No, it just kind of reminds me if I can't remember which market wizard said something about when you should go and throw the rocks into the wettest paper bag. Or yeah, that might have been Dennis Garman. Yeah, but Dennis Garman. And it, it and does. It is a like, wet. It's a pretty wet paper bag. It's a pretty wet paper bag. <laughs> well, anyways, that's just kind of what it reminds me of All when right. you mentioned that. Yeah. So gold uh, was that? Will the breakout stick? Was what uh, we were talking about? And so far, so good. I mean, we're, we're closing at the week high. And, uh, and the bulls, I mean, earlier in, uh, on the CPI numbers, we had a little bit of a pullback, but uh, the gold bulls immediately bought it right back up. And so far, at least so far, the price action remains accumulative and looks good. Yeah, we, we gave some of the gold bulls a little bit of a heart attack. I think our buddy Death oh, Swap there, he was like, don't mention my trade. Don't mention it. You're going to gooch it. But so far, so good. I still so, think. Well, now, still now th the fact that you just said that, you just goochered it. You know I know, it's gonna... no, the double goocher, it's like double secret probation. <laughs> It's fine. Uh, I really think that it's one of those quiet bull markets that nobody's talking about. I'm excited by it. I continue to like it. Okay. And then we got to talk inflation numbers, buddy. Like, oh. uh, whoa. It was off the charts. Uh, they, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to quickly, I'm going to quickly pull up a chart on this because this is, it was a stunning number, right? Like uh, the, um, what's, what's crazy about it is like, we have not seen, a breakout like this. This is using trading economics, but we have not seen a, a monthly print like this in a decade. I mean, you have to, let's see, when do you have to go? You have to go back to uh, like early 2000s and uh, to, to see spikes that were in this kind of 1% range where we've seen. But last, uh, this is a decade high. On this. I just don't know why we're surprised about it. Everything's oh, not. Ripping. I mean, oh. Like, it's just like, it's. Yes. People, it's, I agree. Anyways. I agree, but that, okay. but it was a shocking number, and it'll be really interesting. So let's talk about uh, the top three things to watch now. 
uh, this upcoming week. And uh, well, the first one is, well, if the inflation numbers come in hot in the U.S., what happens in the rest of the uh, developed market economies? You know, we got it coming out in Europe. Is, is it Japan's number I coming Japan out? Japan too, yeah. Yeah, there's a few a few of these Canada major. And that, yeah, or no, I think we had ours, didn't we? I don't know, but the point is, is that they're coming out all over the rest of the developed world, and it'll be really interesting to see whether that trend is a global trend. I mean, it's considering that commodities are sort of the 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 primary short-term driver of this kind of transitory impulse. It's more uh, than just a commodity, so you can see it. It's getting pushed up with the with the wages as well. Right, and so well, the question is, will that happen? What's your take? You will? I think it's going to come in, but now that we've seen this hot U.S. print, I think everyone will probably up to all the rest of them, and they probably won't be as the high market. As- the market may not have as big of a reaction to them because yeah. everyone now is expecting them, but they should come in hot. I, I think we're like, listen, it's going to be the theme for the next decade. I, listen, I, I anyways. <laughs> Inflationista Kevin Muir, yeah. thank well, thank you for your input, buddy. Yeah. All right, so um, yes, it, but you're probably definitely inflation is going to be here for a while. Whether a decade, I don't know. I think you're making a pretty long term forecast, but we'll see. Uh, let's number two though is uh, I wanted to look at that ten year Treasury yield because uh, the first reaction on the CPI was yields broke higher, uh, and I know you got excited and everything, but uh, but. You know, the last day or two, it's been giving back almost the entire breakout uh, from from Wednesday anyway. Uh, and the big thing I'm watching here on the 10-year yield is uh, do we break those March highs? Like do we – is this – like, uh, is the nervousness about inflation and the fact that break evens are roaring and things like this, is that enough to push the 10 year Treasury yield toward 2%? I mean, it's possible. It's definitely the thing to watch. Do you have a bias? Well, you know I have a bias. It's that the yields are going higher. Whether we go higher right away, I don't know. We, I think Big, I don't know. Like a, a couple of weeks ago, we were asking a question in the top three about whether the bond bear market was over. And, and I never were, said it was over. I always think oh it's, come on, you were saying you were saying that you oh, were I, the I was fla- I was flattish for a little while, and I you know and I, I actually well anyways I'm not going to flip flop Kevin Muir. So Here we me, go, that's buddy. Me. Okay, number one, what are you watching? <laughs> The short-term high on commodities. And I think that that, listen, that, this, what you're asking here, number one, is really what's happening in number two. That is why, even though everyone's sitting there staring at the inflation print, at the same time... Everyone knows what's driving it. Well, yeah, and at the same time, we had lumber, you know, collapsing. We had iron ore collapsing. Well, let's take a look at the charts. And let's it, let's yeah. go through them, right? So, like, first of all, here's the Bloomberg Commodity Index. You can see that kind of gap lower. But what it, what's on everyone's mind is what's happening in the lumber market. So this is still the July uh, – not still, but this is the July contract. Obviously, there was a contract roll uh, that happened in, this continu- in, in the continuous contract because, I mean, we saw – yeah, no, actually, you know, it's a, it, it's about the same. It doesn't matter. But the bottom line is, we went from seventeen hundred down to fourteen hundred. There's so, and there's some uh, analysts out there that believe that the real price of lumber longer term is going to uh, kind of normalize under a thousand. That this was just sort of a short term uh, thing. But I mean, do you think uh, that lumber uh, can get down that low? Well, oh, for you- sure. Listen, yeah. this was just a complete uh, kind of supply constriction spike. This, this so then uh, why don't you believe then that this uh, inflation impulse is, uh, could uh, be transitory? Oh, because I think that it's a lot more than just lumber. And I think okay. that for every lumber okay. that we have that, you know, rallies up to 1,700 and then goes yeah. back to 1,000, it was still started at 400, you know, six months ago. And, then and I was... think that we're going to see more and more of these that, you know, we're, we saw this in corn and maybe corn pulls back, but there'll be something else. And hopefully it's something I'm along. Right. And so so let's go through some of the other commodities. Copper kind of got a heavy along the top, seems to be finally consolidating. I'm still obviously very bullish these things, but they've I, gone I have a, a little I have overhead. A, I have a question for you about copper. Doesn't it feel like it's too much of a consensus trade? Oh, my God. Uh, can you find one copper bear? Yeah, I know. That does, it actually scares me a little in terms of like I'm long some like, you know, I because I, I was long. I, you, I sold it and then like in chump, I had to buy it back higher. And I, I'm long just because I feel like I need to be. I can't be a real commodity bull without being long. But it just scares me how many so, people are long. The, are yeah, when, when we thing. when we had Aiden Garibon, uh, I mean, he was and he had those charts on the credit uh, China credit impulse and things like this. Uh, we we basically have seen that things seem to be 
in China, at least the, the rate of their accumulation has been curtailing and things like this. I mean, could we just see that all of these create short-term highs and so we just I see a multi-month you know, consolidation for sure. into the summer? I think, though, one thing to be aware of is that we're not getting driven by China like we were last decade. This this copper story it's a it's much more than China, and and it, for those that sit there and stare at China too much, I but think they, but they are sort of the they're still the uh, they're the listen they're influencing in the it no doubt about it and and I think ultimately there's still a big part buyer. of the reason that this the the kind of. Uh, the boil came off of these things this week was that we had China again pulling back on the credit. And that's well, part of not, the thing. And not only that, but they're also um, uh, attacking uh, their the high prices of steel and things like that. Like, yeah, that's here's, like here's uh, here's the uh, China iron ore chart, right? Like uh, uh, right off of the highs. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, we're seeing some reversals. I don't want to already say that this is a change of trend, but uh, but certainly uh, a, a one or two really ugly days on the. This is uh, steel futures kind of r- rolling over here. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of these and even the grains like. Wheat really kind of uh, uh, broke from uh, its highs. Corn properly reversed off of its highs. The beans put in a reversal candle in here. So the question anyway, uh, the top, of the top three things to watch, uh, number one is uh, have we seen short-term highs? And I don't want to say a new bear market or anything really ominous, but the, this shit's been running hot, hot, hot. And it's uh, at some point mean reversion kicks in and these things normalize at a little bit lower level. And the question really is, uh, have we seen the swing high? And what's interesting is a lot of these highs came in on that inflation number. No, like yeah, a lot they, of these highs listen, came in on one stage. Markets often peak at the, at the, in the, the midst on of the, the best Sell news, on news, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, so, I'm, I'm a, a skeptical that that was the high in things like corn and stuff because I didn't buy any. That would have been it if I had buy, if I had uh, no, no, but then, then, corn, then but that's why been. that's why it's, it would only be a short term high and not a long term high. Like you would if when, when I you finally buy break the, in and buy that. That's the actual high high, and then it's just okay, down I'll, from there. I'll right? keep everyone informed. Uh, oh, absolutely. You yeah. just need to because like when you would finally succumb, and that's that's it. That's yeah. it. All right. So uh, let's let's just talk about this whipsaw in the stock market, right? Let's, let's look at some other charts. And so the the S and P five hundred just uh, got. Uh, its face ripped off at the start of the week and a pretty solid bounce the other way. And uh, what con- but what continues to be the point of interest for me is the NASDAQ because the NASDAQ is nowhere near its previous high. The S&P and the Dow and all these other ones have really kind of uh, – it's been the selling in the tech space that's been the really ugly part, right? And uh, and the Nasdaq snapped back, but I mean we're nowhere near the kind of thirteen thousand five hundred to fourteen thousand zone that was marking all of the kind of high zones for that. And it'll be really interesting to see whether this is really a Nasdaq story more than it is. And, and even like, look at the fangs. Like, I mean, fine, they're up 2% today, but the fang st- uh, stock index is still along its uh, multi-month lows. Yeah. Right, Kev? I, I and, listen, I, I completely agree. That's the story. And I, I think that the mistake will be assuming this is going to go back and everyone's sitting there long the wrong stocks. And they still keep trying to buy those stocks and not realizing that yeah. the market has changed. And I mean, uh, it's that old argument. I, I heard it from Harley Bassman, but like it, um, it and even um, Julian Brigden was talking about it. But it's like the uh, these fangs are like long duration bonds, right? They're they're the, they're and they're, they're, the they're the longest most... duration asset. They're going to get crushed with the. With and the and so, up. if inflation and higher rates is anywhere um, in our future, then these should underperform. I don't know about crushed. Like crushed is a scary thing. Like you need to panic sell, but. This is no longer going to be the leadership on the upside. Uh, this is not where the returns – I mean the returns will come from being in the cyclical space, right? Uh, the, the, the space that uh, is going to benefit from inflation, not get hurt by it. Is that a fair way of looking at it? Oh, I think it's a great way of looking at it. By the way, Patrick, I was thinking about you the other day when I oh, saw an me. article on, on somebody that was walking through all the different stocks in the Dow Jones. And, and no, honestly – 
<laughs> and you just, were thinking of me. Exactly. That's what I do. Because that's what I do. You're like the 1920s. You know, you love the Dow Jones. You love everything about reminiscences <laughs> like cat's pajamas, you know, gimlets, you know, hooch. You talk about you're everything such a like shit. that. You know, such a, uh, shit. a wang doodle. That's what you talk about. You're oh always my going, God. I'm going to go you, watch some wang doodles. Do you, do you have some real stock market insights that you want to share? Yes. Or are you just using this opportunity to <laughs> shit on me? <laughs> no. So I was just. I was just thinking about you because I know you love the Dow Jones and this person was going. I love it because I because I mentioned it like in two episodes. <laughs> no, so. that's because I love it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Jesus Christ! You always talk right. about it, so I always, like. <laughs> I was thinking about you, and uh, you know, so listen. can I go on? Well, uh, yeah, go for it. This is going to okay. be the bee's knees <laughs> if you do that. <laughs> go ahead, the big cheese. <laughs> so let's talk of the VIX. Obviously, oh. big spike in vol. It, it's right back down. But what's interesting is is that uh, still elevated levels of volatility on volatility. But but it definitely uh, the VIX under twenty was something that I didn't. I wasn't thinking that a vol was going back under twenty this quick. Um, I, of course, because you always think it's headed higher. The Always thing? think no, no, but it's oh listen, come on. The realized again, VIX you're is, putting well, words in I'm, my mouth. Of course, I am. It's more fun no, that way. That way. Um, but uh, if you go look at the realized vol, it's way lower, and that's the problem. Yeah. And and people are. But even then, we're getting fifty to eighty point uh, swings intraday. Like how is the how how before yeah, then how going is the ten day. How is the 10-day realized vol not increasing at this point? No, it is, for sure. I'm not disagreeing at all about that. But the fact that it's calmed down now is is not that surprising. You know, yeah. I don't know. Anyways, uh, listen, vol, it, it's it's a difficult game to, to, to play. You know, being long vol, it costs you money. And it's just kind of like bleed, yeah. bleed, bleed, bleed. And then you make money for like four, three day. days. And not <laughs> only that, it seems like the like it really was three days this time, right? And it's usually, you know, it's like yeah. it could be three weeks, but this time now it's three days. And it's just the way that this thing trades, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. So what I wanted to move on to those, just touch on crude oil. And what I wanted to uh, see is could we see an environment where almost all these basic materials and other ones that are rolling over um, start to roll – but crude oil still breaks to a higher high and kind of decouples and marches to the beat of its own drum. It really is not far from actually a 52-week high, and and it was up today. Like it, it, it brushed off that entire Thursday sell day, and it's turning up. Maybe crude oil can uh, march to the beat of its own drum. You think that could, that could happen where we saw the highs, short-term highs? Of like a lot of those uh, things, including lumber and, and all those things, and oil still goes? For sure, Patrick, like, I'm a big commodity bull. You know, like, I think oil will end up at 100 bucks. I've been saying that forever. Uh, I have a funny story to tell you. I wrote this big, huge, long piece about how uh, the Fed is going to go and not allow Wall Street to push them around in terms of uh, raising rates. And the Fed is going to, you know, basically push back on that and they're going to stay, st you know, stand. And then what's going to happen is that, you know, Wall Street's going to go and uh, push up inflation expectations. That was my conclusion. And our good buddy, friend of the show, Louis Gav, sends me a note. He goes, you're overthinking it, big guy. Because I had all this complicated trades about break evens and stuff. He says, they're sending oil to 100 bucks. And I, and like, I agree. Like, that's going to be, if you think about it, yeah. oil is in everything. Oil is the kind of the biggest commodity. It's the most important yeah. commodity. You just and if you're sitting there and you're sitting, you know, watching the economy overheat around you and you're seeing that governments are not willing to go and cut back on the stimulus, then eventually it'll be oil that, that causes the real inflation that really causes the pain to slow all down have, the economy. All I have to say is, is that we could have all of the other commodities declining. And if oil autopilots to 80 bucks, inflation's still going to go higher. Right. It, it's, and it's that big. And, um, and this is therefore, wh why is this not in our top three then? Jesus. I don't know. Cause it's because you want to put that in the dollar on every time. <laughs> Kev, that's all I got, buddy. Oh, it's good. It was great stuff. All right. Okay, for this week in trading history, what do you have in store? 
I want to talk about a great short squeeze back in 1901, buddy. 1901. The Nor- Northern Pacific Railroad. It's one of these uh, stories that from, uh, uh, you know, you could hear uh, Jesse Livermore talking about this one here. So we're going, we're going back there. So anyway, uh, it occurred on May 9th in 1901. And it's uh, we, well, it was the Northern Pacific Railroad squeeze. So our characters were J.P. Morgan, which was the, obviously the most important investment banker in the U.S. at the time, and the two railroad tycoons of uh, Jacob Schiff and E.H. Harriman. And so it was uh, in uh, the 1880s and 1890s where Schiff and Morgan were heavily involved in reorganizing railroads and giving uh, them um, rational capital structures and seeing that the management adhered to new standards of conduct. And But it was in 1898, about three years earlier, where Schiff reorganized Union Pacific Railroad. And Morgan uh, was not involved because he didn't trust this E.H. Harriman character, um, uh, which was the lean- leading owner of, of the company at the time. So uh, let's fast forward to 1901. Uh, James J. Hill, who controlled the Great Northern Railroad and was the largest uh, stockholder in the Northern Pacific, which uh, was used, um, uh, which used the latter to seize control of this uh, another railroad named Chicago Burlington Quincy. It's a smaller railroad that threatened Union Pacific's territory. So when Hill refused to address Har- Harriman's uh, concerns, Harriman uh, was determined to get control of Burlington, and uh, by taking uh, the back door and seizing control of Northern Pacific. So Morgan uh, was Hill's banker. Uh, sorry, Morgan was Hill's banker. So uh, an attack on Hill was a direct attack on J.P. Morgan. So before long, uh, Schiff had quietly purchased a majority of the preferred stock, which had uh, equal voting rights at the time on Northern Pacif- Pacif- Pacific, and held enough common stock to have the overall majority. So Morgan and Hill were caught napping. Uh, on this, and so Morgan at the uh, J.P. Morgan at the time was out in Europe traveling, and he received a frantic cable uh, asking for uh, for his authority to buy 150,000 common shares of Northern Pacific at the opening of the market on uh, Monday morning of May 6, 1901. So three days before all of this. So if Hill could get a majority of the common shares because they were, the, the preferreds were already taken, he might be able to delay things until he could retire some of these preferred shares and retain control of the company. Uh, but um, the cost at the uh, very least would be uh, uh, well uh, in excess of $15 million, which was a lot of money back then, uh, not in today's dollars, right? But J.P. Morgan cabled his immediate approval, and the battle began between the titans. The, and those that caught, got caught in the middle would uh, be cleaned out, buddy. Let's, let's, let's listen to how this plays out. So it was a Monday morning. Harriman and Morgan uh, held between 630,000 of the 800,000 shares of Northern Pacific. So the float was really small uh, already. So by the close of the market on that Tuesday, uh, Morgan Bank had purchased an additional 124,000 shares of the stock, that o- that, which only left 46,000 shares uh, unaccounted for. So basically, everything was being bought in, like 95% of the, short, short, uh, the shares are now controlled. But, uh, but the volume of the shares were still going crazy, like 539,000 shares it was the, traded. It was the HFTs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the vast majority of these, though, of course, were actually sold short. And when, uh, too late, these short sellers realized uh, what was really happening, panic swept the street. Suddenly... The shorts were desperate to close out their positions and willing to pay whatever price necessary. As they liquidated their uh, assets to buy Northern Pacific, uh, stocks and bonds plunged. Morgan, uh, for instance, uh, had, uh, was involved in the new, new U.S. Steel at the time, which is still trading today under the symbol X. But uh, the stock was trading at um, uh, $54.75 a few days earlier. 
skidded uh, from $40 down to $26 that Thursday morning. So basically, the short squeeze on the upside of Northern Pacific was causing a stock market crash in other stocks because everyone had to liquidate them to cover their shorts. That sounds very familiar to a recent thing uh, event that's happened. Yeah. Exactly. So while Northern Pacific ratcheted uh, upwards minute by minute, one broker foolishly admitted on the floor of the uh, NYC that he had 10,000 shares to sell, was literally stripped naked virtually from all these uh, traders caught short, clawing at him in desperation to buy at any price. Uh, that morning, the firm um, uh, of uh, Street and Norton sold 300 shares uh, uh, to one of the shorts at $1,000 a share. That was the, like the peak price, uh, 10 times the amount what the price was trading earlier that week. So just kind of walk through. By noon of the panic, uh, uh, sorry, by noon, the panic was threatening to engulf in um, and ruin many of the short sellers on the street. The shares were trading, started trading around 100 a few days earlier. They were trading 180 the day before. Uh, they were at $400 within an hour of the market opening. By noon, they were at 700. And by 2 p.m. that afternoon, they were at 1,000. Wow, uh, and, and the thing is, is that this is not a GameStop, which is a small uh, market cap thing. Like this was one of the largest companies out on, uh, like the railroads back then were the the, the tech companies of the uh, of uh, of the stock market, right? And so this is like uh, a short squeeze in Apple or something. I don't know, maybe not Apple, but it's a, a huge company at the time that had a big weighting in the market. And so as shares rose, the general stock market collapsed in other securities. Uh, the the Dow Jones Industrial Index would close down 6% that day. Uh, so uh, why such a panic from the stocks going up? Well, due to the exchange rules at the time, short sellers of the shares always had to have the uh, share certificates in hand at 215. So back then, it wasn't all this electronic stuff. They actually had to, uh, to have the, all the short sales accounted for. And so as the uh, price of Northern Pacific rose toward $1,000 a share, many short sellers faced financial ruin and had to liquidate all of their holdings just to raise the cash to cover this Northern Pacific short position. In the end, the Morgan Bank and, uh, and the other company, um, uh, Kuen Loeb or whatever their company was called, uh, uh, called a hasty truce. Uh, they would um, would uh, uh, buy no more of the Northern Perf uh, uh, Pacific stock in their own accounts, and the, all the customers that were short were allowed to cover at one hundred fifty dollars a share, and things calmed down. And that was a that was uh, quite the short squeeze event back in May 9th of nineteen oh one. But so you know what I think is interesting about this, Patrick, is that everyone starts to tell me how this is something that's only specific to our market oh no it's just the current environment it's only because the fed's going brrr or whatever you know all this crap meanwhile this story is as old as time it's yeah. happened all the time this is nothing new and stock markets are the stock markets yeah, and that's just, why we do this history so uh, yeah to keep it all in uh, perspective thanks for sharing that with us today patrick well, Kevin, okay. it's time for skin in the game, buddy. Yeah, so we were oh laughing about it earlier how we think that letting the other guy choose is actually a huge advantage because yeah. we as traders overthink it and just make a mess. Disadvantage, not advantage. It's a huge advantage yeah. letting the other guy choose. Yeah. yeah like it's advantage it, to the one making the best. Exactly. Disadvantage. Just like, yeah. It just shows you that you should fade yourself. You should do a Constanza. <laughs> Whatever you think is your highest conviction trade, just, just go the, the other way. Just do it. So I actually had this client one time way back when when I was a bro when I was a dealer, like uh, on and he was uh, he was this fellow and he was a propeller head and he basically just did like swaps and he was like a tax trader. It was just it was a bullshit job. He was the worst trader ever, and he knew it. He knew he was really bad, and so he decided after losing money for a couple of years trading his own account that he was going to Costanza. He was going to go backwards. But then he somehow <laughs> – I don't know how. He somehow, even though he was going backwards, he still lost money. <laughs> He's like, this is how bad this guy was. He couldn't even stand that. <laughs> it's like the market gods knew. They're like, no, screw you. We're, you're going to lose. Yeah, we know, we know your You're going to lose no matter what. Okay, skin All in right. the game. So I won one last night or last yeah, week. Yeah, 80 points on Tesla and uh, – and, well – 
that that one day break uh, really took care of it. Yeah, right? Elon was it on just my like, side. He was helping. Yeah, me he's helping. Yeah, me that out. Saturday Night Live, yeah, uh, listen, and and he was just him, like, uh, him shitting on Dodge Dogecoin. Or no, whatever. it wasn't Dogecoin. He shit on he Doge, on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. He's like, I'm yeah. going big. If I'm gonna fuck this up, I'm gonna go I'm big. Gonna fuck it up big. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll uh, we shouldn't talk about him anymore. He's just. Uh, I don't know. You know, like he is a genius, though, and he does. Uh, he he is able uh, on the side. Anyway, you no, won whoa, the whoa, bets. Whoa, whoa. I just want to say this. Uh, you know, he is a genius. He 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 basically has figured out electric vehicles. He's figured out solar. He's figured out how to do rocket scientists. You know, on the side, he had a little extra time, so he went and figured out neural links. And recently, he said that he's going to help out the Dogecoin guys. So nice. thank God we have him. Oh, I forgot the boring title. So everyone yeah. that tells me that he's a genius and that he's so smart and he knows all these things, I'm just like, does the guy not sleep? I just yeah. don't get it. Like, anyways, but thank God we it's, have him. Thank God yeah. he's going to go help out the Doge guys because I'm sure the Doge guys are going to be very they curious. Need it. They need it. Yeah, they're for sure going to do that. Um, I did, though, see something about uh, a tweet. I'm going to get myself in trouble, but what the fuck? You know what? I haven't gotten in. I got to pull this. You, you, you need some hate mail. Just I, I haven't got any hate mail. And, and, and so this you, isn't really the asset that shall not be named, right? And the good news is I can shit over Dogecoin because the, the true Bitcoiner guys hate Dogecoin as much as, uh, as everyone else. So I saw this tweet. And I got to bring this up here. Let's just have a look here. Um... Elon Musk says, to be clear, I strongly believe in crypto, but it can't drive a massive increase in fossil fuel use, especially coal. And then Shibotoshi Nakatomoda, whoever that guy is, starts laughing, crying or whatever. And then Terry Tip jumps in there. He says, Billy, oh, I guess this Shibotoshi Nakatomoda guy or whatever his name is, can't say it. I'm not very good at these things. He was the guy who made Dogecoin. And he says, Billy, when you made Dogecoin, did you try to consider energy usage or was that not something you thought about? How can the development community make Doge more efficient? And the response was, and I quote, because this is one for the ages, I made Dogecoin in like two hours. I didn't consider anything. <laughs> Thank God we got Elon on it. Okay. Now I've gotten myself in trouble there. I did talk about, yeah. I, but it's, well, that, you just read a tweet. Yeah. So, uh, but so the bottom line is, we said eighty dollar and I won. Uh, range and you won. Okay. Uh, so now, oh, I got to tell the rules. Okay, here we go. Skin in the game. <clears throat> Skin in the game is a weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager. The other guy gets to choose which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode, and we all know the currency. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full. And there will be no, and I repeat, no netting of positions. Now, okay, I've thought about it, Patrick. I want to spice it up a little bit. They've been kind of boring lately. Uh, I'm going to go. By the way, uh, when, when we're talking about these bets, yeah. there should be one under the stake dinner, right? The the, uh, the mink jock strap? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. We should put the mink jock strap above there. Listen, neither one of us should be doing that. And, and, and thank I, God. I don't know. I've been working out. Like, I might be able to pull it off. <laughs> but I, I, I prefer. I prefer chinchilla. I, you know what? I would pay not I I to. Mean, see, I, I would pay do. not to see that though. That's the problem. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. That's a good line. All right, now. that's well done, buddy. Well done. Well executed, Patrick. Well executed. All right, so okay, so where are we going? I, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do a spread trade. Okay. And I'm going to do the Euro okay. stocks fifty. Okay. One of the most dog shit indexes out there. Can't get it out of its own way. And I'm going to do a spread trade versus the S&P 500. Just straight ratio, no currency adjustment. Just S&P, uh, Eurostock 50 good? divided by uh, um, S&P 500. Okay, hold on. Let me just do it right here. Divided by. So right now I got a closing as a ratio at 0.9625. Shit. Yeah, my charting. Uh, let me chart the other. Doesn't one. matter. You, yeah, okay. Oh, you want to. You, what, what number do you have? 0.9625. That's what we're okay. going for. That's the ratio between the two. Basically, the Euro stocks closed at 4,017, and the S&P closed, whatever, 4,100 or yeah. whatever. So there you go. No currency, just straight up next week. Who is uh, – who, which one's higher? Which in, which one's higher? Yeah. On a ratio. like So it's, it's – like, Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah. I understand. Um, you, know, I'm, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to take the Euro stock. You're going to Kistanz it. Good luck to you, buddy. 
I'm doing it. I'm doing okay, it. Well, I'm, I'm willing to. I and uh, you know what? Let's. Why I'm are you doing? Why are you doing the euro stock? So what's the rationale the, behind this? Because uh, I I think the S and P went too far, and I think the the euro stock will open up stronger uh, at the start of the week to catch up, and the euro and the S and P is going to go down, and I think you're going to be wrong. Okay, well, so, so be it. Uh, you know what? I almost I'm, I'm even do a case of beer, and I'm even going to do a case. Okay, of beer. I'll then take your case of beer. I'll I'll do it. I'll take the other side of your trade just because anyone I'm I'm counting on the double Costanza not working, and um, I, I not even Costanza. I really actually oh, think I'm going to well, win. Then you're even even more trouble. Um, so I was thinking about doing Deutsche Bank because I was looking at that, and but then I realized it broke out, and that you would be probably bullish on that, even though it would hurt you to be bullish. Like pull up the chart on that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that was a, a. Yeah, you would be bullish on that. See, this is. Well, I mean, it is a technical breakout that probably is sending the stock to sixteen bucks. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm going to win. Case of beer, buddy. Okay, you're on. All right. Anyway, okay. Time for no stupid questions. That's right. I almost did the outro there. I thought we were done, but no, we got to keep going. <laughs> Lena, <laughs> hop on. Well, it's uh, <laughs> save us here. Sorry, it was really hard for me to get back on after hearing about you working out for the big job. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Lena, we can. I, I mean, I'm together but, to not. But I, I, I'm not doing mink. I'm going to do chinchilla. Yeah, I don't know what's worse. Um, <laughs> So here's the first question. Hi, Patrick, Kevin, and Lena. I really enjoy the show, and I've been a loyal listener since day one. Your podcasts have always taught me something and at the very least encouraged me to open a cold one. My stupid question is, on the last podcast, Jamie kept talking about the SPAC put right or ability to redeem your shares at trust value, usually $10 per share. I am using TD Ameritrade. How do I go about doing that, and what is the process to do that? Are there also costs similar to being assigned an option contract? I hate those. I I assume you will just point me to my broker to ask that stupid question. I now live across the pond, but would love to form my own piss up at any local listeners. There you go. Piss hmm. up any local listeners. That's what well. I'm first of all, I don't know if the across the pond is means UK, but I'm a big fan. I, I'm gonna as soon as this COVID's over, we could have the the London, oh, I agree. London piss up. Actually, I'm. And then I'm we could go a, try the. I'll do a, and I'm going to do a Lisbon up. one too. Yeah, we'll just I'm, go I'm, around. I'm, we'll just do the piss ups everywhere. Oh, we're going to absolutely. You know what we Let's have to do, to Patrick? Our... We have to go to Oktoberfest. I've never been. You, I've, you know, I did, oh. and it's great. Oh, I can it's imagine. Great. When did you go? Were you young? Like 2016. No, oh no, no you went so recently. For... Yeah. yeah, it was good. I, I'm not going to share the pictures with you though. Oh no, now you got it. Okay, but was it debaucherous? Like, was it just drinking all night? No comment. I'm not going to say <laughs> okay. anything else. He doesn't remember. He doesn't remember. Uh, no, 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 no. I do remember. And there's lots of photo evidence, and that's the problem. <laughs> anyway. All okay, right. So, so I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, um, so a lot of reorgs, there is not a charge. And like when you go and you submit to, a, for example, a takeover or whatever, there's no charge. I do believe for some reason – the SPACs have one, and I don't understand why, and I don't know if it's if it varies, but there is a reorg charge on that, and it could be high. So go ask ahead of time. The other thing to be aware of is that different brokers will have different cutoffs, and you need to be on top of it. And this is part of the reason that SPACs are more difficult in that staying on top of that and getting it in on time is is a big part of the battle. I know I've done some SPACs in the past and they are notoriously need more time than other ones. And I think my broker, you know, that we're talking to needed at least two days, which is unusual because other ones I can go right to the wire. It might be that they're not electronic and that there's more physical. I'm not exactly sure. But the long and short of it is, do not underestimate how much work that portion is going to be. And yeah. that's why, to some extent, if you got to a situation where you were kind of a day or two before the cutoff and the thing was trading with, like, let's say, a penny profit for the person that you sell it to, it might be worth it to just sell it to them. Because... The work is just not worth it. Yeah, and so my advice is go ask and make sure that you're aware that it could be earlier and that there's most likely charges 
and that it is not easy. And, and part of the reason I chose this question is because I wanted to stress that, that that is, uh, let's just say, part of the kind of art yeah. of SPAC trading is that there's a lot of work behind the scenes for those portions. All right. Next question, Lena. So this listener decided to pack in bajillion questions into one email. All right, here we go. <laughs> Hi, Pat, Kevin, Lena. Have you guys tried Vancouver's Granville Island Brewing Lions Winter Ale? Mm-hmm. It is a clear medium brown with a foamy cream head, aromas of caramel, vanilla, cold and nut on the p- palate. It is creamy and brimming with fl- flavors of toffee, vanilla bean, freshly baked bread, and cocoa. <laughs> Sounds lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> It's a staple winter drink here in Vancouver. However, I wouldn't drink this beer if it was free. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, I was about to say it sucks so bad. That sounds like one of my reviews. Okay, let's go. For a second, I thought this gentleman worked for Grand <laughs> Brewing, but uh, <laughs> it's possibly the worst beer man ever created and a disgrace to the craft beer scene here on the West Coast. Do you have it's any so beers from the East Coast that you feel everyone should avoid? One that makes you want to pour it down the drain after the first sip. Oh, there's so many. Like, I've had, like, how many that I've done below five? Oh, there, there is, but... Uh, I'm not, we're not going to purposely shit over no, beers no, because fun, we no, still No, but it's like, funny is because, because what, which Granville one is your favorite? Well, I love the pale ale. It is pale literally, so, like, my favorite beer. So, like an idiot, I go to the beer store and I actually go and grab, uh, and they didn't have any of the pale ale. And so I grabbed this Lion's Winter <laughs> Ale, <laughs> and I crack this thing open. And I'm like gagging, like, "Ooh, what is this?" It, it, it's. Ho- I agree with our listener. It is. It is awful, and it's, should it, it's an acquired taste. Oh, is that what it is? Oh my god! Yeah, and we we, call it an we should intentionally taste. feature it on the show. Yeah, we just should. So we should go grab our, it. We should do just it so yes. people can yeah. actually. No, see we us should see how bad it make is. Make this gagging sound. Okay. Well, listen. Right on, yeah. the, the the gauntlet has been thrown down. It will definitely be uh, <laughs> chosen one of these times. And you know what? The question will be: Do we all finish it? That'll be what the top level. I'll finish it. I'll finish it, but it's not going to be happening. Okay. All right, uh, Lena, fini- <laughs> go to the so question. The real question here. <laughs> On to economics. Commodities have been rallying hard lately, and personally, I don't see it ending anytime soon. I don't see it as simply supply chain shocks, but industries that have been forgotten about for years with little to no Im- investment, few new projects with ore grades depleting and production plants being shut down. It seems China is the top buyer, and that price action will follow their imports. Are other countries too hurt economically to do uh, to do this as well, or do you think it will pick up over the next year, few years? Uh, for example, India, South America, Australia, U.S., or Russia. Do you see this turning into a commodity cold war? Whether intentional or not, it looks like this could be a path we are heading towards. Cheers, guys. Have a great weekend. I don't you want that. Take that one, Patrick. No, I don't really want well, to. I'll actually. take it. I'll take it. Uh, well, listen, I do, I do think commodities are going higher and there will be stresses, but I you know Cold War seems um, a harsh word. But anyway, what's your opinion? So if anything, I think the Cold War is going to be in technology with chips, semiconductor chips. I, I think that, yes, the commodities will be difficult and they, we, will be, we will be competing for them. But at the end of the day, you know, we go and we'll, we'll figure out some new mines. And yes, China will be ahead of us in picking some of them. But the ones that the thing that's really scary and that ends up being kind of one of my biggest concerns that I haven't figured out how to actually express a view on yet. But it seems to me that we've allowed as the Western you know, nation for all that technology to be pushed out to Taiwan and other places like that. And we've left ourselves exposed. So if I see a Cold War developing, I think it's going to be more on the technology side than the commodity side. Right from the macro tourist bounce <laughs> there we to, go. Your, to your ears. All right, go for it, Lena, next. <laughs> the last question. Hello, I have been following the macro tourist for years, and I also followed when he decided to charge for the letters. The nerve of that guy. What a jackass. <laughs> I am very happy. I am very happy with the product worth every oh, penny. God. I am managing money for a conservative clientele and looking for insight on where to move the portfolios going forward in infl- if inflation really kicks in and or, and or if the Fed slows bond purchases. Stan Druckenmiller was on CNBC this morning and his interview finally pushed me to write as I have been putting it off for weeks. I've been replacing fixed income with market neutral alternatives for over two years now. I have also added inflation-liked bonds, but the real yield is still negative, so not really happy with that. 
I added more alternative strategies in the late fall, early summer 2020. I have added base metal ETF, XBM, in the summer 2020. Yes, I am Canadian. So my fixed income allocation is much lower. I am in base metals, etc. What would you add at this point in the cycle? I am considering lowering stock market exposure, so I hope for some ideas. Okay, I'm going to take this one, Patrick. I hope so. <laughs> So this is a this is a really great question because this is what everybody is struggling with, right? We've all had this kind of yeah. easy 60-40 portfolio. We've been able to have the 40% with bonds and they've been negatively correlated to stocks and uh, you know it's been kind of just yada yada yada. It's been perfect almost. And now all of a sudden if we get into a situation like Lynn described where we have inflation, these bonds might end up being difficult. And obviously some of the things that you can do is what Lynn described. You could add gold, you could switch your value, you know, switch more into value, reduce the duration of your stock portfolio in essence by by you know getting out of those high tech growth stocks and buying more real economy, real stocks, like the stuff that, as Dennis Garman says, that it hurts when you drop it on your foot. So that's one of the things. Now, uh, as some other kind of ideas, this investor is obviously a sophisticated investor. And one of the things that I think that you can do, obviously, is buy, let's say, inflation break evens. That's one of the th trades that I love. I continue to love it. I've owned it forever. It's my only true diamond hands position that I ever have. It's, it's the only thing that I just kind of keep and, and doing that. And so the trouble is that's difficult to institute because you need to be long tips and short the bonds and isolate out just the inflation component. The other idea to yeah. think about, given that this investor is sophisticated, is instead of having interest rate risk, you could actually have just credit risk. And there's a manager that we're going to have on our show, hopefully. And it's uh, it's it's called East Coast Capital, I believe is the name of it. But there's a bunch of Canadian firms and U.S. firms that do it. And the long and short of it is that they sit there and they look at the kind of the short end of the corporate credit curve. And they invest in high-grade, uh, you know, triple a or double a um or even actually now that i think about it, some double single a um corporate paper and they lever it up and so what they do is they get exposed to only the credit portion they get rid of all of the interest rate risk and they only take the credit portion this strategy is risky and there are times when it doesn't do that well in terms of like obviously when credit spreads widen Having said that, I've watched this this manager of uh, East Coast through a couple of cycles now, and I've been hugely impressed. I would just tell people that are interested to go have a look at it. It's for obviously for um, accredited investors, and it's a sophisticated strategy. But I do believe that it is something that might be able to replace the fixed income component of your portfolio. And ultimately, that is really the problem, right? Like that that's the portion that everybody's missing. Like, what do you do to just earn that yield without just going and chasing stuff? And one of the ideas is that when you're looking for a variety of different ideas, like meaning that it, different uh, diversifying over different things, one of the ideas is to maybe go and put on some credit trades in a properly sized position. And I would highly suggest you go to East Coast Capital. I wanted to thank you. I had enough time to go to the bathroom while you... Yeah, I uh, just felt like, you know what? <laughs> I, 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 I've been meaning to talk about this for a while. And, you know, it is it is a difficult trade. And there, it's not it is, for everyone. It, it really isn't. Like, there's no doubt about it. This is no. for... But uh, for people of that are that are kind of accredited investors and, and willing to do it, and I, I'm calling them East Coast Capital, and now I'm looking at it, and maybe it's not what they're called. So let me just look here. <laughs> One second. Um, about. They are. Well, look it up while Lena t t tells East, people where to find it. It's just called. Uh, it's, it's E C F I M I. E C F M I. I, I might have added a letter there. East Coast Financial <laughs> Management Investment. I guess I don't know what that stands for. Anyways, just there's a bunch of them. They're, they're just my favorite, but there's a bunch of them that do, do this trade. And yeah. if you can go, you can go look at it and have a look. See if it see if it works for you. Well, thanks, Kev. So if you like any <laughs> answers like these, please submit your questions to <laughs> no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Okay, all right, it's my turn now. Okay, no, again, again. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> 
Patrick's getting mad at me because I'm going on. Okay, so thanks for tuning into the. Mar- no, it's all good, buddy. Thanks for tuning into the Margaret Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow on Twitter. It's Lena Manning the Post. She does a great job, but she gets fed up by talking to Patrick and I. You can listen to I to uh, Margaret Huddle on all the networks: Google Podcast, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get all of our latest content. Instead of asking you to go and review ones, uh, review our podcast i went and found some so i'm going to read a couple because i think these are fun i don't even know where i found these first one comes from the uh fellow by the name of i well it could be a woman uh, the person by the name of with caution and uh, the title is the (laughs) mullet and he says okay this is the review and uh about our podcast great guests great hosts truly a labor of love because they have no sponsor boy they he sees right through us (laughs) um like a mullet they get the business done up front, and by the end, you're at the tavern wishing the night wouldn't end. Oh, Wish caution. Oh, thank you so much. And now, the final one, I'm going to read two of them, is by nickname1567. He says, uh, it's uh, under the t- thing, says, fantastic. This is amazing host with humble, insightful perspectives on the market. He must be listening to something else. Um, great guests. <laughs> My only complaint is that while I get two doses of Patrick a week with macro, macro voices, Kevin doesn't have his own show I can look forward to. Aww. I love this guy. Nah, uh, you know what? I would never do one letter. without Patrick. <laughs> oh, it's too thanks, much. Well, that's, listen, but I, I can't say this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have. Are, I, I'm I'm fine with having an open side of my of our relationship. Patrick goes and takes advantage of that, and I just don't. I just sit at home waiting for him. Thursday nights well, are so tough. You know for what? Me, you know, like you ha- you have to realize is that uh, you're the mistress. Like uh, I, I I that's true. I, I, I was, was I'm I am the one that you're cheating you're on. Other. That's true. Actually, yes. you started with right? the other one. You're right. Right, and uh, and it's it's I, w- I wanted something more fun. What is it called when uh, <laughs> when a man's a mistress? Uh, uh, I don't we got to look that up. That doesn't even. Well, you exist. know what? Let's put this in the. Uh, let's get rid of this, and then we'll talk about that in the after show. So, Patrick, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna, and uh, you can um, find me at BigPictureTrading.com. And for me, when, oh yeah, yeah, for you, uh, Kevin Muir, or you can go check out my <laughs> newsletter at themacrotourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. You like how I just pitched you and you like just had to hit the ball I just, there? And, uh, <laughs> I, just, I just picked it up. Yeah, I picked it up just, off the floor and just threw it. <laughs> okay, let's go figure this out. What is a male mistress called? Well, it says the term mister can be used or paramour. Oh, I like what? paramour. That's what I mean. I'm a paramour. I'm Patrick's paramour. I, I never heard of that term. I think I've heard I it. It just doesn't it catch on. It does not it does, roll it, off the tongue. Could, because it doesn't <laughs> really exist. It's, it's, it's a fictional thing. Yeah. <laughs> but it says it, this term can be applied to either partner in an illicit relationship. Oh. So it doesn't have to be solely to a male. The man is being financially supported by, especially by a wealthy older woman. He is a kept man. That's what it's called. A kept man. I'm a kept man. <laughs> 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 Kevin Paramore Muir. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. Uh, we got the mink jock, the chinchilla yeah. jock. Well, that's what Patrick makes Paramore me wear. Muir. Oh, my God. This is going. This is gone. <laughs> gone off the rails. Patrick always gets oh. Patrick always gets worried when it gets vaguely like, oh, yeah, too yeah, much. Yeah, gets, like, you can see him. You can feel him right get now. uncomfortable. He's yeah, like, oh, no, no, no. Tension, no. The tension is building. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's turning okay. red right now. Okay, but. let's do the beer. Um, let's just be honest. Patrick couldn't drink it because no. he didn't have it. And um, yeah. Lena and I are the only ones because we're trying to polish off the beers that Patrick was supposed to when he was supposed to be in uh, From Barbados. Barbados. And we're not. So it's just Lena and I doing this one. Uh, I do not like it as much as I thought I was going to like it. I'm going to just give it um, a 7.5. Well, I thought it was pretty oh. good. Lena. I didn't. I didn't like dislike it. That's for sure. That's for sure. It's it's good. So seven five is like down the middle. I know. That's it's like boring. It's it, it's an the amateur. The most boring. Score. It's an amateur score, as Dave Portnoy would say. What do you, what, Lena? You didn't give us your number though. Oh, I'd give it a eight point one. Oh, okay. 
I feel like it also we should says, track them. I feel like Lena here. gives a lot of eight ones. <laughs> it also says here, drink fresh, don't age. <laughs> Best served with friends. <laughs> you gotta like that. That's a good line. Drink fresh, don't age. Yeah. Huh. I think I've probably aged five years after. That. Okay. Oh. Uh, so do we have anything to talk about or no? Not really. <laughs> Not I am I am going uh, I'm starting to get anxiety about my travel schedule but it's uh, you know what we never talked about so Patrick and I got the, the vaccine and yeah. we never talked about the fact that where we got it <laughs> <laughs> uh, no we didn't like you thinking something dirty but that's not what it was like Patrick phones me up and says Kev I just got a just got a, a thing at, um, uh, at Costco at Costco <laughs> and all I can think about is like idiocracy yeah. when that guy's like, uh, welcome to Costco. We love you or whatever. He keeps saying it over and over again. And that's what I'm basically that's where I got my vaccine. And the greatest part about it is so Patrick says he got the he, he figured out a way to get in there. Like there was spots opening up. Squeeze it. So I squeezed in there, too. And the good news is that Patrick and I got the one that they don't give to anybody. And then they, they finally have outlawed in Canada, so, so we don't even So, know. like, you can't get oh, the no. second shot of it. Yeah. We got the AstraZeneca out. Now, we're still here, oh, so thank no. God. But, uh, um. So, wait, does that mean you guys will have to get a first I shot? I don't know what it means. They don't, they don't, I don't no even know. We're just like do. human guinea pigs for them. We're just pin cushions. <laughs> we're just going to, like, take. I'm going to wait it out until you guys have your both shots. And then, no, no, listen, they're not even giving them out anymore. Yeah, so you just have to do the Pfizer. You're going to be there. fine. You're going to just go get the whatever. But yeah. I heard that there's like a single shot. No, that's the J&J one. They don't, they're don't. they they're having oh, trouble. Johnson they're not doing that one either. In Canada, we're just doing, it's basically all Pfizer. Mid- that's it. Mid- uh, you know what? I'm going to be I'm gonna be in the States for a couple of weeks. I'm just going to get the Johnson Johnson down there and get it done. No, th- but Patrick, you can't do that. Patrick thinks it's like a cocktail. You already had a first shot. <laughs> just uh, you could mix them. You could totally mix them. I know this much. Like it, you could, you could get what them all if it if you makes want. you lose your hair? Will you do it still? Yes. I don't know. I don't care. The uh, Just, anyway. So that people make too much drama about. Oh this well. Stuff. Anyways, like, we're here. We we didn't die, so hopefully it's good. Um, it is interesting though. We are stuck now because Canada has basically said they're not going to do any more of them, and so it's us. Yeah, we're we're predominantly doing both. That we have both the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna. That's right. So that's what we're doing. That's what everybody else is getting now. And because yeah. Patrick and I went to Costco, <laughs> we got the AstraZeneca. <laughs> But, but I got it, a big tub we, of we got ketchup. A good price. We got a good price. We got a good price. Yeah, the big cup of, a cup of ketchup. <laughs> Having said that, I don't know about you, but I thought it was amazingly well done in terms of like organized and like we, you know, yeah, it was kind of shocking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you get there, you get it done, and you leave. It's fine. That's yeah. good. Anyways, I do. I, I, I thought it was fine. Okay, well that's ah. us, Patrick and I. <laughs> if we're not around, Anything we'll know what you're watching. Think- I think starting today, I'm eligible to go get. Oh, really? Go, go register for it. I th- I'm pretty sure it's either today or Monday. Oh, nice. So go get um, yourself in line. Well, the thing is, if I may or well, I may or may not be at going to Miami. So. We'll oh, so you can just like, do it there. Go get the. Maybe if yeah. I'm there, maybe. Yeah, vaccine tourism. But the. Part, the <laughs> The problem is you can't get both shots down there unless I think you stay there for like Well, four actually, I weeks, think right? that one of the issues is like what's going to happen. So let's say you got like one of the Pfizer's down there and then you came mm-hmm. back here and then because you, you get registered with the government and stuff. All the yeah, all the libertarians are going bananas like, oh, God, I can't believe it. like you have to give out your stuff. I'm just well, that's the thing. Like, I would rather just get the second AstraZeneca so I can actually have the paperwork that I that I got two shots. But if they don't give it to me, I guess I'm a pincushion. I got to start this all over again. <laughs> I just want a piece of paper that says I'm f- freaking vaccinated. Wait, so they don't have any information on what they're gonna do for people who's had their first shot. Well, but of they course no they have no idea. <laughs> this is, it's blind, blind. fucking Canadian government. <laughs> blind, blind. Oh, they're just making God. shit up as they go. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> It's like us with fundamental trading. (laughs) Let's just see what happens. Put this position on. We'll figure it out. Let's see what happens. Uh, No, Uh, I'm just giving them a hard time. 
Uh, you know what? I, I still, I probably would still do it. It's no, it, like, I understand that there were some negatives, and I'm just happy that we're getting through and we're getting our population vaccinated, and hopefully, we're going to be like you look at uh, UK, you look at Israel. Their their cases is a plummeted. It's it's a good thing, and I hope we get uh, the rest of the world vaccinated so we can hopefully. Or we could be to like normal. the New York Mets, where they all get vaccinated and still half of them get it. Is that true? I, I thought I saw a headline or something. I, I hope know, I'm you're not probably making spreading shit up. crap now. I'm, <laughs> I'm a, Wait, well, so you've been hanging so with George Gammon thought... too long. <laughs> 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 he is going to be with me down in Miami. We're going to have a great time. Uh, like half of that hard, so like uh, the, half the crew is not going to believe in it. You're going to be around all sorts of hardcore guys that are just be like, no, no, no mask, no vax. There you go. Yeah. Wait, didn't didn't Doug Ford government um, extend this, you know, stay at home order or whatever until June second? But are you guys exempt exempt from it if you guys are vaccinated? No, I have no idea. We're not. No, the, he's still. Um, nobody's exempt. Even if you're vaccinated, nobody's exempt. So you still stay have to stay yeah, home. Yeah. No, like no, we're all we're all doing it. Did you see the guy that wrote the song uh, to Country Roads about the? Oh, that was so about funny. The golfing in Ontario. So for those yeah. who don't know, I don't know if this is true. This sounds like it might be an urban legend, but they say that Ontario is the only place in like North America and maybe the world where golf is legal. I can't, well, I can't that's... believe that's true. But anyways, I'm sorry, it's illegal. Yeah, so like you're not yeah, allowed well, to during play golf. COVID, like it... here, like in yeah. Ontario. and they're right saying now. that everywhere else in the world you can play golf. Maybe it's so. I don't. Oh, during the yeah. COVID thing, you yeah. mean? Yeah, but yeah, they 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 said in the first lockdown they said golf is okay. And that was during, I think, in April. And then when they did the extension of the actual stay-at-home order, they took away right. golf. Right, but the question is, is there anywhere else in the world that does outlawed oh, golf? Probably not. Well, that's, that's what probably people are not. claiming. Doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm not going to let the truth get in the way of good story. Uh, th- the yeah. point is, this guy wrote this song, and it's, uh, Google it, it's like Country Home, Country Roads, and it's basically about golfing in Ontario. It's so well done. Oh, it's so well yeah. done. It's, well, I laughed so hard yeah, when I no, saw it. You tweeted it. Yeah, no. Or you could just go to Kevin's Twitter handle. It's in there. Yeah. By the way, it, it was the Yankees, not uh, not the Mets. Oh, and is it true? Did, like half of them? Yeah. Did? Yeah, like eight eight players and like a couple of coaching staff. They were all vaccinated. Like fully with and, both of them? Yeah. No, you just offended a bunch of Mets fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah, shit. Probably. You're in trouble now. No, I, I was I, in I, New I, York I, City one time. And it was on the, you know, when you get the double decker bus uh, tours and yeah. we, we love them, you know, like we have a bunch of kids and it's fun to go around and, and we get it for like the whole weekend. And then we just use it also to get places like, it'll you know, instead of, yeah, yeah it's a hop on. Yeah. Hop so on. you get the hop yeah. in. So we just do like a hop on, hop off for like the whole weekend. And then we can use it also to get to places. Well, anyways, I got to one point and we had a guy on there and he was. I can't remember if he was a Mets or a Yankee fan. I think he was a Mets fan, which I thought was weird because we were in the city. But um, he literally went from being like the most uh, proper tour guide to just this diatribe uh, about how bad the Yankees were and what a bunch of crooks they were and all this stuff. He literally went for five minutes. It was worse than me with credit trades. (laughs) <laughs> like literally and I was just shocked at it and I he just like and I was like oh my wait this was a tour guide yeah this was the tour guide that had the had the like microphone oh so he's like he's ranting, ranting about, the about this while like and I just like what the, the hell dude I just want to go and like see the Empire State Building and like I had to listen to this guy go on about what how terrible the Yankees were the, this they hate each other these two teams like or at least oh like like it makes the Habs and the Leafs look like a walk in the park yeah. It's shocking. Which which they're playing against each other. I know. In the First time it's happened in like what forty years or something. It's like ever since the original six or something. Yeah. So though for those it's... who don't know, Toronto usually doesn't make the playoffs. First of all, but um, <laughs> it's very rare for Canada, you know, for our two teams, Toronto and Montreal, to play in the playoffs. Uh, Toronto. Let's see when they last played Montreal playoffs. When was that, Patrick? Like, do you remember? Oh, I don't know. But it was, it's was it been forever, so this is going to be a pretty freaking big deal. 
Well, what pisses me off is it basically means one of the Canadian teams will lose, though. Like, I'd rather play in the- No, but uh, but there's a, this year, because of the COVID, there's a Canadian division. That means one Canadian team is guaranteed to make the semis. Because, uh, because all, it's the four Canadian teams that play each other, uh, and only one of them gets to advance. Oh, okay. Right? So w- one Canadian team is guaranteed to make it into the Final Four. So s- since 1978 was the last time we played them. I don't know wow. if this is right. I'm doing Wikipedia. I think I'm reading this right. <laughs> Isn't it? Well, like that's. And Montreal will beat us four zip. Which yeah, is that's like, not a like nonsense. yeah, because yeah, the seventies, yeah, the Montreal had a great team, right? Like that was the and that, in the eighties and in the nineties. Yeah. Well, like, that was when and, I think and we had Harold Bar- Ballard. Yeah, that was the start of um, the Montreal <laughs> doing the left wing lock, and they and they, and they played the trap. Anyways, that's like too much hockey for you guys. Yeah, too much. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'm done. Done. You don't want. You guys have anything I, else? I don't. Lena, do you have anything? Wait. You have anything you want to add? Did you watch anything interesting? No, I'm just finishing Formula One. Oh, you're like survive. hooked. Oh, it's so good. It's so well done. I. Is it on it Netflix? Me go. Yes, it's three seasons of gloriousness. <laughs> it's, you gotta, you gotta go. So, Le- Lena, here's a question for you. Are you gonna? Yep. Have they turned you into enough of a fan that you'll watch the sport live? Uh, you know what? I had just talked about it with Luke yesterday. I said, you know what? This makes me actually want to go see the race. Oh, you see it, but like usually, like if you're a true fan, oh, you mean you like wake at, have you, have you wake you up mean? Sunday morning at like you know six in the morning or whatever to watch it as, as they race around Monaco. Have you? Have you? But have you ever uh, done the Indian Toronto? No, it's I awesome. Have not. I've done it. It's uh, I, I had the tickets where I got to walk uh, in between all the cars before they started and stuff. It was awesome. It was a well, great good experience. good for you. No, no, no. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, fine. I'm just telling you that you, you'll you have a great... Oh, my God. Whatever, Lena. I'm done. I'm done. You ball busting. No, but I would definitely... I think I definitely would watch. I told I told Luca, I was like, I think I would watch this live on TV if I... Like, I, I had nothing... I didn't know anything about Formula One before. I didn't know anything about racing cars or anything like that before. And I didn't even want to watch the series, the documentary, but it was so well done. Um, and my heart would be racing every episode. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. I would totally watch this in real life. Like in, if the race was actually happening right now, I'd go see it. Well, there you go. Or watch it at home. There you go. Yeah. So I think you have to wake up at like early in the morning. Like I'm not, I, I, I don't do it, but I, I, I do I have a... Well, a, because it's mostly... Yeah, so I have a brother-in-law that's yeah. super into it with his son. And they would get up in the morning, like we'd be at the cottage and they would... Be like, okay, we got to get up at like some crazy time or whatever. <laughs> I like how they were like, oh, Grand Prix in Monaco, and it's like all these yachts, and people are watching the race from the yachts, and it's so amazing and so beautiful. And they're like, Grand Prix, and I don't know if it was like Austin or somewhere in the U.S., and it's like all trailers. <laughs> <laughs> they're nice trailers, we, though. They're nice trailers. We, yeah, nice, nice trailers. Like they're RVs. Like, they're like you shouldn't RVs. knock those things. Those things are pretty sweet. Some of those can cost an extra digit. Oh, I know. My parents are looking into the Oh yeah. Them, so, yeah, they've been sending me videos of like, what about? So are they gonna are they gonna get the one like with like a proper like it's like a almost looks like a bus? No, their friends have one. Yeah. They got one last year, I think, and they sent me. My mom sent me a picture from inside of it, and I was like, whose house house are you <laughs> in? <laughs> no, they can be and really then she's nice. Like, this is an RV. Yeah. It's like one of those ones that expand. Like when you press the button, it expands. For like, sure. The room becomes like a double the size or whatever. Um, I don't know. I'm sure it was. It was. Uh, it didn't. It was more than a penny. So. So I'm gonna pull a Clark Griswold, and I've rented one for the summer. Right. Yeah. So I'm. I'm gonna. My condolences. Yeah. Well, no. Are you kidding? It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> so wait, you got one of those like bus kind of ones? Yeah. Like the big. I did not one, get like the, the biggest one. Bus? I got the second biggest one that they rent. I wanted so the biggest one, can... but then my wife was like, "No, let's not get the biggest one." So like it's it'll be enough for like your whole family to comfortably yeah it? well hope maybe I don't know oh, it's wow. gonna be just a shit show no of course it will the good news is my wife gets sick so she's gonna drive uh, her car um, behind oh so she, wh- <laughs> well what? yeah she's gonna drive her own because she's just like she has to drive and she doesn't want to drive the big one so well and plus you kind of need a car anyways like when you go like yeah, you don't want to end you up can't in, just... 
yeah. you want to pull up to get like a burger or something down yeah. the street. I'm, it's going to be awesome, though. It's going to be just, I'm um, going to drive across Canada. It's going to be real Canadiana. And I am actually a little bit jealous. But, uh, is, is that I don't like know if a... I would do it with an RV, but I certainly wouldn't mind making that track. Is that like a middle-aged men kind of thing to like get an RV? Well, it's, a, it's it, no, it's like a, it's one of those things on a bucket list, right? I don't know. Like, it just feels uh, like there's nothing to do this summer. Like and it's a, like I don't like usually we would be going somewhere and it's, we can't go anywhere. So like what's safe that we can do? So I went and booked this thing. And so we're, we got this thing rented and we're just going to. Except like every campsite will be closed. Well, it doesn't matter. You're in an RV. Yeah, yeah, but you gotta but park it somewhere. You're gonna be parked in a Walmart yes, every so fucking Walmart, night. So <laughs> Walmart, you can park in Walmart. They're free. Right. So you're you're basically oh, you doing a Walmart tour of Canada. No. Listen, when you well, that's Patrick, what you're doing. you know you're well so... as well as I do that when you get He's to the top jealous. of Lake Superior, there's nobody there. Like literally, there's okay. sections where there's nobody. In like middle of Saskatchewan, there's gonna be nobody. So you're just gonna park on the side of the highway? No, no, I'm gonna go to national parks or whatever. We've already planned yeah. that. I'm but sure they, they to park like for instance, RV. they um, uh, this long weekend, uh, the a bunch of the national parks are all closed. It's like, no, it's no, just it'll a be golf open course. And then my good buddy. Oh, you think? Look at you! I, like listen, you're looking, Mister. Yeah, no, I am optimistic. My good buddy, my Don't good buddy Andy trip. has uh, lent me his. He has a condo at Golden, which is a, a ski resort up. Uh, or sorry, a kicking horse, BC. which is in Golden. And he's got a condo there, and he's been very kind and generous, and he's he's the greatest guy, and he's offered me th- that we can take his condo. So we're going to drive there. And unfortunately, though, it doesn't take dogs. So uh, the dog and me are going to sleep in the in the RV, and everyone else is going to have a nice condo uh, <laughs> condo thing. Whatever. It'll be summer. It'll be yeah, exactly. And so then uh, we're going to do my, – my son's really into mountain biking, so we're going to mountain bike a whole bunch. Oh, it's going to be the best trip ever. Hopefully. It should be fun. I, I'm looking forward it to it. It must be so much fun. Yeah, so wait, where are you traveling to West Coast? Like all No, the way I don't think we're going to go all the way to Vancouver. Although he okay. is talking that he wants to maybe go out to uh, go to school at UBC. And we're like, yeah, shit, we're there anyways. Maybe. You should just go and hang out with uh, Louis Vincent Gatt. Oh, for sure. I should. He's, yeah, listen, listen he's, Wist- already, he's such a nice guy, Louis. And he's already yeah. said, you know, come by and uh, we'll go biking in Whistler and stuff. Just make it. Make it. Yeah. Make the you know, it's just though it's, it's already a long way. And then we got to get back. And then not only that, we got to drive the other, one of the kids back to the other coast for uh, school. Right. So, so wait. So you're gonna drive almost. Like, yeah, so he's gonna coast. go the distance. He's gonna first go to Vancouver. No, so that's my point. Start. I don't think I'm gonna. And go then all he's the gonna way make Vancouver. it. All I'm gonna the go way to Banff, and uh, you know, a little. How, how long is the drive? Jesus, to Banff, Banff from is like here. 12 hours away from the. I know, but it's just that, like, and then we got a bunch of things we want to do at Banff, and then we're gonna go back, and then we gotta then go to the other coast. Too. Wah, wah, wah. So wait, so, so you're gonna drive all the way to Banff? Yeah, that's brutal, here. and then stop there. Like, you know what? No, no, wait, but. And then Mrs. McIntyre also is going to follow you in her car all the way to BAM. Yep. By herself in the car. Oh, well, kids will be there. Well, you guys, they're, they're doing like six, eight hour. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like we're going to go, we're going to go to the top of, uh, we're going to go to the Sioux Dude, the first day and then we're going to make it to the top I, of. I'm of, calling you out on this. If you're doing this, this is one of those things that you're going to talk about for 10, 20 years. And the fact that you're not going to make that last trip all the way and make it all the way to the coast is a, is a cop out, and you're gonna regret it for the rest <laughs> okay. of your life. Just make the freaking drive. Or maybe drive. go all the way up to you. Even if you it's leave, supposed to be super nice in the summer. <laughs> even if you leave the trailer with the, with your family, just get into the car and make the drive. Just touch the water <laughs> so that you oh say you did it, and then drive back. I'm gonna do it, Terry. Fo- I'll do it for Terry. There do it you for go. Terry Fox because he never got to make it to the other coast. Well. Yeah. Now you do people it in BC, in, in Vancouver, will expect you. And now you can go test out more of the Granville Island. Brewery For company. sure. Yeah, and then you got to bring back a case of the Granville Island the Lions uh, shit. It was, it was, it, was it that bad? Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> it was really bad. Don't bring a case. Um, Maybe bring three. Do you know what I think was so funny yesterday? Last time we had discussion about, did we talk about Tragically Hip last Yes, we tra- talked yeah. about tra- Tragically Hip last time. And then Jason Polanski was, um, he kind of wandered in into our Twitter discussion and asked about the hip. And then he probably regretted it from then on in because he got every Canadian giving his opinion about the top songs and everything like that. And poor Jason probably, he probably hit mute because he probably got fed up of it. Um, but he was a good sport and he did say he listened to it. And he, he, and a lot of people seem to agree with me that if you don't like the hip, you just don't listen to them loud enough. All right, I'm out. I'm going to go do dinner. 
You guys, great show. Okay. Take care, everyone. Have awesome. a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for yeah, listening. No, it's great. <laughs> and hey, make the trip all the way to the. We'll see. The we'll see. Just do it. We're, we're gonna need pictures and you know. Just do it. Proof. And then Lena. Yeah. You gotta announce whether or not you're gonna end up making it out to Miami. I think people really care. <laughs> I, I will. Okay. I, I will announce a week before. All right. Just to keep everybody on their toes. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. <laughs>